great play, Mark. It's a real killer. Pathologic is one of the best and smartest games that's ever been made. And you know that's true because no one's played it. Okay, that's not quite accurate. A fair amount of people have tried to play it. The Steam release has achievements, and there's an achievement for surviving the first of the 12 in-game days. A day lasts about two hours. According to its global gameplay stats page, just 13.2% of all players made it that far. The achievement for day one is called I'm Not Dead. It's just that kind of game. It occupies a certain kind of space in game criticism. Some game critics, mostly the ones who are... Uh, good. Will sing its praises day and night, call it the best game you've never played, argue it's a shining bastion of everything gaming could be but often isn't, and labour very intensely to explain why games don't have to be fun to be good. Journalist, board game critic, and wizard Quentin Smith wrote three incredible articles about it in 2008 for Rock Paper Shotgun, which are probably hugely responsible for a lot of Western awareness of the game. But when someone reads articles like these, they might make the horrendous mistake of actually trying to play it. And we all know how that goes, don't we? The game's just not fun. It's not interesting to look at. It doesn't feel good to play mechanically. It's frustrating. The story is confusing and wordy and translated from Russian by a mystical rat who only speaks in riddles. It lacks almost anything that would normally keep a person playing a game. And yet, people keep saying it's great. I think it's great too. It's an incredible game that barely anyone will have the resilience to actually play long enough to appreciate, and that's maybe even the point. So, this time on the assorted mess of unrelated concepts that can scarcely be called a YouTube channel, I'm going to talk about all the things I find particularly interesting about this game and what they bring to making it so unique. I'm also going to talk about the problems it has that prevented it from seeing mainstream success, and then give a spirited defense of half of those problems anyway in the name of their artistic value. It's not a bad game, it's an amazing game. But it's also a bad game. It's a major time investment too. In many ways, it's a more interesting game to discuss than play. It's possible that Pathologic only exists so that we may speculate about it. <laughs> so, in a way, making this video is really for my benefit more than yours. I played over 60 hours of this thing, I have almost 600 gigs of Pathologic footage on my hard drive, I get to make a video about it! That was the deal! <laughs> Part 1. What is Pathologic? Probably should, that should have gone in the intro. On the surface, it's a very easy game to explain. Pathologic is a first-person survival horror RPG with story-rich and atmospheric. Doesn't it look fun? It's set in a town deep in the Russian steppe, at some ambiguous point in the last hundred years. And by ambiguous, I mean imaginary. There are guns, but they're kind of old-timey types. A lot of the decor ranges from the late 1800s to early 1900s, but there's some baroque-looking buildings lying around. The town is built around its meat industry, so there's bowls everywhere. But the abattoir is some kind of huge, ancient building fused with the earth, and its workers live in a huge housing complex that looks nothing like the rest of the town. And some buildings are actively impossible, like these staircases to nowhere. And then there's the polyhedron, a giant floating tower that cannot be, sticking out of the earth Earth suspended by unknown means and made partially out of its own blueprints. So, yeah, I'd say the time period's pretty ambiguous. You play as one of three different kinds of doctor who each arrive in the town for their own reasons, just at the beginning of the outbreak of a horrible plague that threatens the entire town and probably the world if it manages to spread. The doctors have 12 days to get their shit together, save the town, and somehow survive long enough to do that. In some ways, it's kind of an immersive sim. You have an inventory, weapons, clothes, and items. But look at the wording of these items. It's not food, it's rations. It's not medicine or healing, it's drugs. And what is other? Well, that's where you keep less common stuff you can use or sell, like hairpins and bracelets and flowers you picked, and are those human organs? As soon as you hit new game, it becomes clear that any simple description of its basic genre conventions doesn't capture how the game actually feels. The three playable characters, the Bachelor, the Haruspex, and the Changeling, aren't simply chosen by a menu. So, it's all about trickery to you? Wherever have you come from? No. No. I detest trickery, but if we ourselves are to suffer deception, our hands are no longer tied. Where are we? We open in a theatre, which you actually visit in the game world later, looking down on all three characters as they argue on stage over who is best suited to solving the problem. I can do miracles. Just let me. 
Will you please be quiet? The dialogue gets across each character's basic viewpoint. It's also written in a strangely theatrical way. The truth is my shepherd. I will perform the operation. Medica morbo adhibe. Don't you go all bossy on me, clever clogs. This calls for the gentle hand of a surgeon. Your gentle hands are used to killing, not giving life. You will inevitably do harm. As for Brainy, he has no regard for casualties at all. It sounds written, it's not even trying to be natural. It's like you're watching bad actors stumbling through their lines while rehearsing for a play. Which you are. The actual play is about to begin with you playing as one of them. They conclude they can't work together and time is of the essence, and the house lights go down. We won't ever get along. I suggest we be on our way. The sooner the better. Off we go then? Let's go. The clock is ticking. When you go to leave the theatre, then you get to choose which one you play. Even before the game started, the presentation is strangely off-kilter and brings in ideas of performance and the theatrical. It's definitely the weirdest character selection process I've ever experienced. You can't play as the Changeling until you've finished the game as one of the first two, but frankly, if you're actually going to play the game more than once, you should play both of the first two first, and really you ought to start with The Bachelor. He's regarded as the default pathologic experience, he's slightly easier, and his character is an outsider from the town, so you learn more about it from that perspective, and that's really helpful. The Bachelor, Daniel Dankowski, is a Bachelor of Medicine and is working on the ultimate utopian project a doctor can aspire to, defeating death itself. It's not going well. The powers that be, the government I guess, are shutting down his lab unless he can come up with something substantive to back up his ideas. He's come to the town because he's heard that a man who lives there, Simon Kane, has lived a remarkably long life, so maybe he can learn something about defeating death from him. Your quest log has the main mission for that day, the side quests for that day, and your overall mission, which for the bachelor is saving his career, and maybe all human life, by learning how to defeat death from Simon. So you go to meet him, and you learn from Simon's brother Georgie that he died right before you got there. Oh. Well, Georgie asks you to help him find out who or what killed him. Luckily, you think you have a lead on how he died, because he met with a town community leader, Isidore Burach, right beforehand, and he was a respected local cultural figure and the town's head doctor of sorts. So they might have discussed his health, or who might have wanted him dead. So you go to meet him, and he's dead too. People are speculating about a serial killer or a demonic steppe creature of myth, the Shabnak Adir, being responsible, and then you start to notice signs of a plague, and it becomes clear it probably killed both of them and is about to kill everyone else. For days and days, as the lives of people in the town and your own odds of survival get worse and worse, that original quest, Dankovsky's bright-eyed, naive mission to defeat death itself on his way to meet a dead man, will stare you in the face every time you open your menu and check your mission. For Dankovsky, this message doesn't update when saving himself or the town become his priority. For the rest of your sad life, you have to deal with being reminded that you came here for something completely unrelated. So yeah, get used to that. Pathologic's not a game about getting answers or resolutions to your personal quests or even about being heroic. It's not a game about feeling safe or having fun. It's a game about Part 2, Futility and Disempowerment. You might be wondering why I'm reading the words out when they're on the screen, and that's because some people like to listen to these videos instead of watch them. I put a lot of effort into my visuals, but, you know, that's fine. So I think an important way of explaining the features and effects of this game is to talk about the first thing that'll probably happen to a new player. You start the game in the house of Eva Yan, who's letting you sleep upstairs. She tells you that she's heard noises outside and there's some strange men hanging out in her garden. Oh, I know how games work. This is a tutorial quest. RPGs sometimes have easy early quests that act as a sort of microcosm of the game, a tutorial for how various mechanics work. So you go outside and you're greeted by these strange boys. These aren't the characters hanging out in her garden. These are more tutorial figures. These are characters that pop up a lot in the game, tragedians and executors. These are their costumes, their actors at the local theater, performing plays and so on. But executors also perform important roles during the plague, like getting posted up outside the houses of important sick people to relay messages. Given that the game is already being framed as one large theater performance with you as an actor, sometimes they break the fourth wall. Like right now, where they're telling you, a living human person, how to 
live in the world. These characters teach you how the basic mechanics work. Time advances no matter what, so if you don't do the important things you're supposed to be doing, other people will have to do them for you and might get sick. And you might need them not to get sick, so maybe don't let that happen. Your reputation is important, so don't start too many fights. Eat food so you don't starve and die, and so on. This game came out in like 2004, so the idea of having to eat and not die and time mechanics was actually pretty unique for the time. This is executed in an awesome way. Look at how this tutorial is framed. This conversation won't take too much of your time, especially since time stops during dialogues, and our dialogue is extremely important. You need to know how to play after all. What are you talking about? I'm neither a gambler nor an actor. He doesn't understand what the tragedian means by play. The tragedian is talking past him to you, so that you know the mechanics, but the Bachelor has no idea why someone's telling him this. Need I remind a wise man like you of the fact hunger is sated with food? Food can be found in shops. The Bachelor is having the weirdest conversation of his life. The fourth wall breaking stuff in this game is genuinely the best. Anyway, what's next? Ah oh yes, the side quest! So you go around to see about the men in Eva's garden and get a cutscene showing them and you realise one of them is a creepy looking inhuman worm man. Great, another thing I'll have to figure out later, I guess. If you try to make them leave in a threatening way in dialogue, a fight starts. The way fights work in this game is you get beaten to death in a matter of seconds and the game is over. Oh. Oh jeez. Hello again, you two. Ah, oh, no need to be so dramatic. Actually, no, that's your job, isn't it? In Pathologic, combat deliberately feels off. The game has fighting mechanics in the same sense that a car being driven off a cliff has flight mechanics. Punching is slow and plays a random animation with a different length before the attack actually goes off, and its range is highly deceptive. The range enemies have with their attacks is hard to decipher as well. It's very swimmy, like there's lag in a single player game. You have to learn to intuit exactly when to close in for your attack to hit, and when to step back and not get killed. It's quite hard to be good at fighting in this game. The game does everything it can to stack the deck against you if you get in a fight. The muggers who spawn at night open their combat with you by throwing a knife at your face, which no joke deals like 90% of your health in a single hit. No one gets distracted by guards once they pick a target, they just keep going for you while the guards chase them and hit them in the back and they seem to only reliably drop loot if you're the one who kills them. You can right click to trigger a blocking animation, which is pretty cool. It doesn't actually do anything though. Guns are eventually an option. They kill in one or two hits, but bullets are super rare, they're really expensive, and you have a tendency to miss even when you're pointing the gun right at someone's head. I don't know, it just feels a little weird. But this actually works in the context of the gameplay because it further disincentivizes you in doing combat because even sure bets like bringing a gun to a knife fight are never really that sure. Fighting always feels like a risk and it instills that you're not really supposed to live through this game while getting in tons of fights. You're never handed satisfaction or enjoyment from fighting, which normally is the sort of thing that's the most visceral part of a game experience. The game knows this too and likes to throw challenges designed to hurt you and not be satisfying right in your face. Once you're past the point in the game where you're very likely to have a revolver, a weapon with six shots before a very slow and vulnerable reloading animation, a side quest pits you against seven guys and you have to stand still to open the menu, which doesn't pause the game, to unequip it to switch to anything else. It's like the creators are laughing at you, seeing what deliberately weird, difficult thing they can put in front of you and have you still actually do. This whole fight is optional, so really, it's your fault if you decide to try a dozen times to shoot seven people with a gun with six chambers. Remember how I said early quests in games are like a tutorial? The lesson of this tutorial is you're gonna die if you make bad decisions. Heck, you're still probably gonna die if you make good decisions. Fighting is hard and punishing, especially against more than one person, and realistically you wouldn't be seeking out fights like this. You should be trying not to get killed first. A two-on-one fight in the first two minutes of the game before you know all the quirks of its combat is a death sentence, and the developers know it. They put this fight in here to teach the player lessons about how they should be thinking about the idea of fighting, or on the whole taking unnecessary risks. Death is cheap, and your health is expensive. I mean that literally, too. How do you get health back? Simple. Just rest in a bed for a few hours and... Oh. No, that does nothing. Actually, it just made everything worse. My hunger meter's gone up now. Okay, I'll eat an egg and... Oh, no, that's, that's not gonna close my wounds. It's an egg. It made my hunger go down. But wait, it only made it go down a tiny amount. And that was all the food I could afford. 
oh, I'm fucked. The only reliable way to heal is to take a painkiller like Meridorm or Novocaine. These are expensive, but they cause you to regain health over the course of a few in-game hours, which is agonizingly slow, but it works. They also cause a lot of exhaustion, which also raises over time while you're awake and causes you health damage if it maxes out, just like hunger. There are items that heal you without any downsides, tourniquets and bandages, but they don't heal you that much. They're pretty hard to acquire, and they're worth enough money that you might as well just sell them and buy some more delicious eggs. Basically, in this game, taking damage hurts. After retrying a few times, if you manage to kill the two people in this fight, the items they drop are barely worth the health you lost to get them. You get a couple of bullets, like literally a handful, and you don't even have a gun to use them with yet. If you used the weapon you started with in the fight, your scalpel, it's taken durability damage and is now already less effective and you'll have to pay to get that repaired. Oh yeah, weapons lose durability and effectiveness in this game and they do it super fast. This fight is barely worth doing. When I was playing, I just reloaded and let the guys get on with whatever they were doing. They're on the run from the law, whatever, they'll be on their way soon. It's their problem and they're not interested in you or Eva anyways. You can even ask them what the deal is with this guy. He's just one of the locals. Some of the people of this culture are just physically different for some reason. For me, the canon choice my bachelor made was to leave these guys alone and just let them go away. It's fine. It's not worth it. This opening is an exercise in disempowerment. You're not the main character of the story. I mean, first of all, there's literally two other main characters, but on a deeper level, you're not special, and sometimes you have to keep your head down to survive. You are nobody's hero. Your character's stats page is a really helpful way of keeping up with all eight of the chokeholds the game has you in. Reputation goes down when you start fights, kill people or other generally immoral things, and goes up when you do good things, like in quests or killing muggers or giving money to the poor or medicine and alcohol to the sick. Not to cure them, but to help ease their pain so they can die in peace. A pretty morbid way of doing good. Despite being an RPG where you can get into fights with anyone you want in the street, a la Fallout or Elder Scrolls, the game has a very powerful ability to strongly incentivize that you don't do whatever you want. Not only do fights hurt, but your survival relies on you being accepted by society. If your reputation is too low, shopkeepers won't sell to you, and then you're kinda doomed to starve to death or to get sick to death or die to death. Exhaustion just goes up over time and is reduced by sleeping, but there are things like raw coffee beans and lemons which reduce exhaustion and give you more time to do things other than sleeping. But lemons increase your hunger and coffee decreases your health, just like in real life. But what's immunity and infection? Well, immunity is your ability to resist the plague. Kind of? Not really. When the plague becomes a factor, if you walk into a cloud of plague or get touched by a plague carrier or bitten by a rat, you get the plague. Your immunity defaults to 50%. There's expensive medicines you can take which increase it temporarily, but these also hurt you to use, and you have to use quite a few to raise your meter a useful amount. If the meter's absurdly high, and I mean close to 100%, and you're wearing a couple clothes that protect from infection, if you get hit by the plague, you might, might not get infected. It'll just lower your immunity a bunch so you get infected the next time you touch something. Hooray! If you get infected, you start to lose health over time, and occasionally your camera gets all wobbly and distorted, and your infection level starts to raise non-stop, and as it gets higher, the effects will get worse. And if you get too infected, some NPCs will try to kill you with fire. There are antibiotics which decrease your infection level, but these also hurt you to take, and are also expensive, and don't actually stop the plague once you're infected. How do you cure the plague? You can't! Fuck you! Don't catch the plague, shithead! That's not really up for discussion, is it? It's a fucking plague. Plagues are really bad. Statistically, in Europe from 1200 to 1800, roughly 100% of all living people died of the plague. Okay, there are items that can cure the plague, but you really want to not be wasting those. The game's about curing the plague, so you kinda might want to not use those on your personal status effects. If you get infected, either load a save, or prepare to have one extra thing to worry about for the rest of the entire game. There's one other important meter you'll need to keep a close eye on as well. Time. The clock doesn't wait for you. Every day has a main quest, and you have to complete the quest on time, or someone else has to do your job for you. And they're not as good at your job, so... The night has come. 
the most pressing endeavors of the day were fulfilled at the expense of several lives of your bound. If you don't complete a quest in time, the story advances without you and one of your friends gets sick, which means you won't be able to talk to them unless you give up some of your medicine at the door to keep them upright for the day. Some quest lines take place at certain times too, so you need to keep an eye on things and plan ahead. Between all this and reputation, the game imposes a horrible feeling of dread on the player, a pressure that never really lets off. There are so many things to manage, to think about, just to stay alive. And that's not even getting into the story you're trying to progress while you do all this. You're always on the clock, and almost always need to be in two places at once. And as you navigate the town to get where you're supposed to be going, you get more and more aware of how slowly you walk. You can't run. It's just this. It's horrible. You're not a character in a fun RPG, you're a person, traveling at frustratingly person-like speeds, trying to outrun about eight different ways of dying. This is one of the first truly divisive things about the game. The walk speed is slow, and most of the game is about walking from place to place, walking to buy food, walking to buy medicine, walking to the trash can to find things to trade, walking to talk to people, and walking to the theatre to see it predict all the walking you're gonna do. Speaking of the theatre, every day after midnight they rehearse a new play. These often comment on what happened that day or predict the future in quite interesting ways. People only fear bloodshed when it's their blood and their shed. Yeah, that's right, stay out of my shit. What, what the, the fuck, fuck are you talking, talking about? about? And as the plague spreads, you start having to either take longer routes to avoid infected districts, or start risking infection and having to load saves and lose even more time. This is not fun. Or pretty. It's just walking. I've had people tell me the walking is what turned them off. It takes so long to get anywhere. Even if you're not in immediate danger because things are going well, you're still giving up a lot of your time going places. And the clock is still ticking down. So you're always racing, and you're always racing slowly. But this is also the point of the game in Microcosm. It's not supposed to be fun on its own. Here's a head scratcher. Are games supposed to be fun? Maybe. But should they always be? Is that the only reaction games can or should explore creating in their players? Well, I think it's useful to at least experiment. This boredom isn't a bug, it's a feature. It adds even further to this sense of disempowerment. It also has a profound emotional effect. As you get increasingly aware of your impending doom and how limited your abilities to get things done really are, even walking around becomes tense and stressful. Pathologic is the subtlest survival horror experience I've ever played. The act of standing still in the game makes me nervous. I'm wasting time. Oh shit, it's three o'clock, I have to be somewhere. After a while, even the process of the travel starts to really get its hooks in you. Once you get used to it, there's nothing quite like it. As the story deepens and becomes more complex, the travel becomes an opportunity to think about what's happening, if you're being played, why you're being asked to do this, who it really benefits, whether someone's messing you around to waste your time and stop you figuring out what's really going on. The walking becomes the most engaging thing in the world. I've never been more alone with my own thoughts than when I was playing Pathologic. I'm one of the two remaining defenders of No Man's Sky, the others were lost in the Great Purge. But when it came out, I liked it at the time, almost primarily because it came closer than any other game to doing this. In fact, I made a reference to Pathologic in my little video about it. But in reality, Pathologic is still the absolute greatest at this and puts No Man's Sky to shame, especially when all the patches made it much more like what everyone else wanted, and much less like what I had enjoyed. Man, I should revisit that game. Imagine a game holding your attention not because anything in particular is happening, but entirely because it's got inside your head. Oh, and then just to make sure you're paying attention, a plague cloud made of screaming skulls flies at you and you go, ah! The constant racing against the multitudinous clocks of time, exhaustion and hunger, trying to get enough surplus stuff done to afford to manage it all, and the many ways you can be killed easily or survive but with the game made even harder by taking damage or losing time or getting infected, or getting so desperate you decide to kill a guy in a dark alley for his food, is the exact opposite of a heroic fantasy story. 
At all times, the player feels powerless. Instead of the player being free, but with some survival mechanics to keep track of, it's flipped. The game is a large collection of things that will kill you unless you submit yourself to their whims. You're free, but you should be doing what you're supposed to be doing or you'll fail and die. You're placed under a level of constant stress maintaining your frail body while racing against time to actually get anything else done. You're always technically in control, but it's hard not to avoid the feeling that you're the one being played by the game, constantly reminded of all the things you don't have time to do, all the things you need to avoid, and worrying maybe the game's gonna come up with something new to stab you with on the next day. Which... Uh... Part 2.2. Day 2. I came up with the titles in this video to amuse myself. I don't really care what you think about them. Day 1 is kind of a walk in the park. You even have enough leeway to take a walk in some of the parks. You get used to the basic mechanics, buy and eat some food, progress the story a little, and meet some of the other characters, and at the end you realise that a plague might be about to hit. If you manage to survive day one and complete the quest, well, congratulations, you've done better than most players, but the real game hasn't started yet. Day two is the next big hurdle, and even less people make it past that. The Bachelor's Day two is where players will decide if this game is for them or not, and the drop-offs in terms of achievements demonstrate this pretty well. You'll know if the game is something you're going to try to continue with after this. So you make it to bed on time with a decent amount of money prepared in case you need to buy more things, and with all your meters sufficiently handled. Maybe everyone's warnings about how hard this game is were sufficient to prepare you, and you've got this in the bag now. On the morning of day two, prices rise tenfold. The money you started the game with is no longer enough to buy a single delicious egg. The plague hasn't properly hit yet, but words got out there's an outbreak coming, and people are stockpiling food and medicine. Not only is being able to afford food suddenly a much more pressing question than you expected, any food you do have on you doesn't seem like a good idea to eat. I mean... That's a lot of money you're holding. To make matters worse, the town's governor, Alexander Sabarov, won't agree to do anything about the plague because he'll be seen to be overstepping the mark if the other rulers of the town don't agree on there being one. So a plague is starting, but no one with the power to take proper action will help because everyone has their own agenda. So you spend a good deal of the day with your hunger rising and no sure way to solve it because your money is worthless now, running around trying to find enough proof to get all three of these groups to agree there is a plague and to give Sabarov of the power to start making emergency orders. Your main quest is getting these warring factions to agree that the obvious problem exists. Along the way, you pick up two side quests. In one of them, you meet up with a former buddy of yours, Andrei Stamatin, and upon agreeing that the shits hit the fan, or rather the town, you decide to get out while you can. But Andrei won't leave without his brother Peter, who doesn't want to leave that much, but Sabarov, the guy who will get emergency powers anytime soon, bears a long-standing grudge against Peter, which will probably lead to him getting killed once that happens. And this isn't unfounded, by the way. When Sabarov does get emergency powers later in the game, he uses them to try to get Peter killed. So you need to get proof this is the case to get Peter to agree to to leave with you both, which you get from talking to Maria Kane, Simon's niece, about this issue. However, if you tell her why you need to know this, she intervenes and prevents either of them from leaving, failing the quest. Unbeknownst to you, Maria needs these guys in the town for her own reasons, so don't do that. So you go to give this information to Peter- AH oh, FUCK! This is an actual recording of the first time I saw this statue. You can see in the footage that I freeze up. Like, it's terrifying. This is the second game ever to jump scare me with a fucking still object. It's genius. I can't wait to show you the other one sometime. That one's great too. You know which one I'm talking about. You all agree to meet at the train station at 10 p.m. So you're starving and the town sucks, but at least you have an escape plan now. The second side quest is called The House of the Living. Several of the town's more charitable people have decided to establish a shelter for when the epidemic hits, and they each give you money to buy some food for the shelter before the prices rise any further. I will make the purchases. I have to do a lot of walking today anyway. <sighs> the money they give you is not enough to buy all the food they want, so you actually have to use whatever spare money you have or sell some of your items to afford this. You give up all your remaining money and items to get food you also need just to give it away, and you have to watch your hunger go up and your time go down as you rush around trying to find the stores with any bread or meat left. When you get it all, you're told the location of the shelter so you can deliver it. Let's just break this down. Part of a quest on a day when food is incredibly scarce, involves carrying a ton of food somewhere and not eating it. It's 
actual torture running around watching that hunger meter go up and not knowing how you're going to resolve it, even though you're technically holding a solution the whole time. It's awkward and engaging and tense in a way that no game has achieved before or since. The game doesn't punish you for eating it either. You don't have to do this quest. You can just keep the food or the money you were given to buy it with and just ruin the chance to build the shelter. But you don't, because that's hardly what a doctor would do preparing for the plague. And maybe there's a reward for doing it or it helps you further down the line. You're making a positive moral choice on a quest in a video game. You know how this works. There's something in it for you. So you go to deliver the food. The house has already been hit by the plague. Everyone there is sick and dying, and the plague clouds will actively hunt you through the house if you stay too long. There's an executor there who tells you this mission was obviously a failure. So you leave and go back to the quest giver and give her all the food intended for the shelter. She gives you some nuts to tide you over as thanks for your hard work. The reward for successfully following this quest to the end is dramatically worse than the money or food you could have just run away with. At the very least, this quest results in finding proof of the plague. So the part of the main quest where you go in search of a plague-ridden house is at least solved by this too. If you do the main quest instead though, you get a genuinely terrifying encounter where as soon as you realize you've found a house filled with women who have the plague, once you try to leave, it spawns two more right where you just came from, and they try to grab you to appeal for help and give you the plague if they do, and you just have to dodge past them. It's genuinely super scary and just emotionally awful. You're just abandoning these women to die. It's a horrible nightmare, which thankfully you cannot do if you did the House of the Living. Finally, Zabarov has the power he needs to start establishing hospitals under quarantine, rationing food, distributing medicine, and so on. And he even gives you a gun. So it's a day late, but things are finally where they should have been already. Perhaps too late to prevent a full-on outbreak, but better than nothing at all. You can defend yourself a little better now, at least. Luckily, you're getting out of here soon. So 10pm rolls around, your quests have been one major failure, and one minor resolution to a power squabble that you're sure will heat up again tomorrow, and you haven't eaten anything. So you head to the train station. When you get there, you find guards blocking the trains. The Stamathin brothers are nowhere to be seen, they just didn't show up. And according to the guards, no one can enter or leave the town now because it's under quarantine thanks to the emergency powers you helped Sabarov get. You just trapped yourself in the town. If you try to talk your way out, all the guards attack you and you lose reputation for killing them because these guys were just doing their job. Best of all, there's an executor standing there. This one doesn't say anything, and seemingly can't be seen by the other characters. He just stares at you, letting you know he knows how dramatic the irony is, laughing at you for thinking you can just leave the town. So you're trapped, and you're starving. In the middle of the night, you go to see a play being rehearsed at the theater. The play's about how you're fucked. Bad news. The governor will abuse his power. When the morning hits, the game nonchalantly says, it all ends in less than 10 days. Exhausted from a day's being a pawn in someone else's power grab and scrambling for resources for a quest that was doomed and starving half to death, you eat one of the nuts. Great. You're completely fucked and you're on day three. Day two is excellent game design. It's deeply engaging, watching your attempts to get anything at all done get frustrated, and it also sets a general tone for the game. It does the special game design trick that I like to call recontextualizing. Players come to games with their own expectations and understandings of how a game is supposed to work and feel and play, a certain general set of ideas about what all this is supposed to be like. If you're playing an open world RPG, you know what dialogue trees, shops, trading and hunger and time mechanics and moral choices are, and you think you know how they work. Day one partially plays into this. It takes pains to show how fragile you are and all the work you have to do to not die, but it's doable, it makes sense, it doesn't feel that much different from a normal game. When the prices rise so massively that money is effectively worthless and you were given no warning this would happen, everything about how you relate to the game experience is thrown out the window and you feel that happening in your brain as you play and realize what just happened. Walking around while slowly starving, getting rid of the rest of your own items to try to get the food for a doomed quest 
carrying food you can't eat around and wondering when you will get to eat and watching your meters inevitably rise as you race to help the town and only barely achieve anything, you start to make realizations about the scope of this experience. You weren't playing a game with the mechanic where you have the option of using money to buy things, you were playing a game about having no money. You weren't playing a game where you have to eat food to survive, you were playing a game about starving. You weren't playing a game where you can choose what sort of morals you have. You were playing a game about how betraying the people who trust you is better for you than trying to be a hero, and doing the right thing is an exercise in getting your time and energy and money wasted. Survival horror RPG? Lies. You are playing a pain simulator. This is a deeply masterful trick I've seen very few developers pull, where commonly understood mechanics are twisted in such a fashion as to force the player into a specific mindset and relationship with those mechanics, and everything straightforward suddenly becomes different and off. Once day two happens, you no longer have any idea what's coming. Money turning out to be virtually useless, the growing threat of the plague, who knows how bad things will get in the next few days. Even though the game doesn't get that much harder, and technically the game isn't that hard if you know what you're doing, this sequence of experiences fills you with dread for what might happen next. And the game doesn't stay this difficult forever. The point isn't how hard the game actually is if you measure it objectively, the point here is how the game makes you engage with it. The game has a reputation of being depressingly punishing and difficult, and while all this is true in places, and it does get very hard in brief bursts, the fact the game manages to create this reputation without always being that hard is a serious credit to its execution. Day 2 grinds you beneath its heel, and even if things pick up for you or you master the art of stabbing bad men for extra cash, you'll never really feel in control again. And that is genius design. One of the ways you can make surviving slightly easier is to sell your gun. The gun you just got is worth a lot of money, and so are bullets, which might be good for solving some of the more pressing issues of the game. You don't get in that many fights, especially if you're avoiding them, but being put in a position where the best chance of survival is getting rid of one of the main things a first-person shooter is known for, it's even in the name, that's a notable thing. Almost everyone I know who made it this far sold their first gun, allowed themselves to remain vulnerable for the chance to maybe not die of something else. You can also learn to hold on to certain objects to trade for better things. In trash cans, you can find all kinds of stuff. Sometimes people throw out jewellery or needles or empty bottles, which you can refill with water for free and drink to reduce hunger and increase exhaustion, or save up to trade for bandages with the town drunks. The children in the town will trade flowers or nuts or blades for various useful things like medicine and bullets. So the nuts you got were useful, you just might not have learned their value. And this is another bigly clever thing the game does. The economy isn't as simple as I give you money and you give me my delicious, delicious egg. egg. It's a web of needs and wants from a variety of NPCs which informs the value of myriad different items, which you can benefit from if you pay attention and learn. The game never hands any of this to you, and that makes discovering and using these things feel good, like you've worked it out and solved something. One type of child in the town, this little girl, sometimes, very rarely, has an item on her called Schmauder. They're expensive to trade for, but they're worth it. If you use it, it reduces your health to almost nothing, but it cures the plague. There's a very limited amount of real cures available throughout the story, so getting your hands on some of these is a real help. Even if their downsides are too much for you to risk using, other people will pay thousands and thousands of rubles for them, almost $50 worth, and hey, maybe some of your friends might need curing later. Just saying. This all works in the context of the story, too. The bachelor is in a foreign town whose customs aren't like the ones he's used to, and so are you. And all this tension and storytelling happens largely while you're just walking from place to place in a town. It's quite an experience. And this experience is enhanced by the game's music, which is some of the best in the business. It takes a front seat during a lot of the walking, and it does excellently with that spotlight. It's intensely atmospheric and moody, and when it needs to be, it's strange and unsettling. It feels at the same time natural and alien, like you're witnessing a normality that isn't familiar to you personally. Mm -hmm. 
synths are used alongside more naturalistic drums and rhythms to further destabilize the setting. The music even evolves with the story. Each main region of the town has a theme, and when that area gets infected, its theme changes and becomes even more strange and distorted. On top of the slightly remixed original music, you can now hear a distant and frenzied chanting. It's great, and some of the tracks sound subtly different for different characters, which is awesome. The opening theme is a real banger too. Except, it sounds oddly familiar. I can't quite put my finger on... Oh. Oh damn it! Part 3. The Writing. By now, if you've been pausing to read the text for some reason, you'll be very aware of how strange the writing is. And whenever you begin dialogue with someone, they actually say something out loud. When we do not find peace of mind in ourselves, it is useless to seek it elsewhere. Truth does not do as much good in the world as the appearance of truth does evil. Oh wow, that's a good quote. I'm gonna use that in a future video and pretend a philosopher said it. Watch out for that! Everyone's very wordy and flowery, talking about their dreams and visions, and sometimes it's hard to tell if you're discussing philosophy instead of the task at hand. The game has a very specific writing style, one more evocative of your typical novel than other games, and it is, in my opinion, very well written. It succeeds in making you feel transported to a world where things aren't as simple as they seem, where dream and metaphor are entangled with reality. If a sentence feels strange or hard to follow, it's doing that on purpose to make you feel weird, like you have to put effort into understanding. Instead of simply telling you you're a small part of a strange universe, it makes you feel that way by refusing to pull its punches with the ideas it's meditating on. Try this on for size. Do you believe in prophecies, Andres de Matin? It depends. I agree this may seem inconsistent with materialism. On the other hand, when your own experience convinces you to their effectiveness, you have to take them into account. I wonder that myself. For a moment, I thought he was driven by the same feeling that I am. A great man, when unexpectedly betrayed by the people he loves, will often seek to fill the whole universe with his blind spite. Yes, the feeling is indeed familiar. No one talks out loud like this in real life, but that's not a mistake, it's part of the point. You're stuck in a world where people do talk like that, and have to untangle it to make sense of things. It's very hard to call this game pretentious, because not only does pretentious mean affecting a greater importance than is actually possessed, and the game definitely does say important things, but it's also too self-aware about how all this looks, and it loves to make fun of itself. The plays make fun of the characters and plot and writing style, the cool fourth wall breaking executives complain about how unwieldy their outfits are. It's lovely stuff. While this video is definitely going to spoil lots of the plot, there's lots of really interesting aspects I won't have time to go into detail about. If you want a more complete breakdown and analysis of the three characters' stories, YouTuber Sulmatol made a great video doing so, linked in the description. There's such a ridiculous amount of depth and complexity that it still astounds me now, and even trying to cover all of it is beyond my powers. When I was talking about this with Mandalore Gaming, whose video on Pathologic is also really worth checking out, he offhand mentioned an entire aspect of one of the characters I'd completely forgotten about, and isn't even in Soul's video either. This game is about as dense with story as a real novel, with an equivalent amount of words to read. Obviously, really getting across the cumulative feel of the writing style is hard to do in video form, and I was never really good at book reports anyway, so instead I'll talk about some of the more specific storytelling techniques that help the game achieve what it's going for. Firstly, the constant use of deception. Other characters lie to you for all kinds of reasons, or have access to incomplete information and then share it unreliably. There's lots of manipulation and hearsay going on, and it's left to you to figure out what's actually happening. Every character in this game has their own end. Why does Maria Kane want to keep the Stomatins in town? Why does the Inquisitor seem to always want to investigate the Polyhedron and find an excuse to destroy it? Did Olgimsky lock up the Termitary to prevent the plague getting in? Or has it already struck the place and he was trying to prevent it spreading out? Are his complaints that you should be looking into the Kane's business first a genuine concern for their power plays? Or is he just trying to get you out of his hair by pretending to be? This goes the other way as well, of course. Sometimes you can play dumb to learn more about someone than they'd let on if they 
they thought you weren't on their side. And sometimes you can lie for your own benefit, like you can get a second pistol if you tell Andre you don't have one when he asks you. Figuring out and catching someone in a lie, or successfully lying to someone else, feels great because you really are gaining ground in a struggle for truth and control. It's very engaging getting lied to by a story and having to put the pieces together yourself. Secondly, there's the way you experience the same overall story from three very different perspectives. The Bachelor, for example, is a clever and rational-minded man, but he's so obsessed with pursuing his specific lines of inquiry that he spends a lot of time getting tricked into doing busy work or ignoring the real story. And when he is trying, he can be pretty bad at it. He's an outsider, but rather than working to gain people's trust and get on a decent footing, the player's text options relate that the character they're inhabiting can be a total asshole. But could I please offer you a piece of advice? I need no advice. I mean, look at this choice. This is something The Bachelor thought to say. You're supposed to be asking this guy for help, Daniel! What the fuck are you doing?! Several characters in the story have the power to predict the future, and The Bachelor has the power to be a dismissive piece of shit to all of them. The Bachelor says things that he must think in his head sound really cool, but to say to another person is like super weird. You are broken, Lara. I, on the other hand, am used to winning. <laughs> At numerous points in the game, you can just randomly say a Latin phrase to try and sound clever. Medica Morbo at Hebe. Gasperty lies to The Bachelor about who is responsible for the town's water supply being destroyed, but the guy who actually did it just made a mistake. She's buying time for him to get to safety by sending you on a wild goose chase, because she rightfully believes the Bachelor will try to fucking kill the guy if he gets the chance. The Bachelor is such a piece of shit. Look how he talks to this poor woman. This is incredible characterization. like you're just stuck in the body of this pretentious buffoon. It's great. In conversation with the Harrispecs, Aspity casually refers to the Bachelor as the prickly prick that'll bury us all. The bachelor's plot is largely a struggle to do what seems obvious to him with his degree in medicine, but which conflict with the values of the people of the town. He wants to inspect Simon's body, but the Canes have a family ritual where bodies are left unobserved for 24 hours. Then later he wants to dissect an infected body to study the plague, but the local culture forbids any kind of defilement of the body, including surgery and autopsies. It's a special rite given only to special families of medicine men, the Menku. The Bachelor spends multiple days literally and figuratively fighting the people he's trying to save, to the point of getting arrested, attempting to subvert their laws so he can help sort things out. By the end of this, Dankowski has a very low opinion of the townspeople and their traditions, and decides he has to work within them to get anything done, and turns to someone who can do the things he can't. Over the course of his story, Dankowski finds himself siding with the characters who appeal the most to his belief system about the world, and against the more folksy wisdom of the Harrispecs and the supposed miracle working of the Changeling. All three characters play through the same 12 days, and these stories aren't separate. Whichever character you play, the other characters are dropped in the world too, and follow their stories as well. You even interact with them as part of your story. You cross paths with the other characters quite a lot, but you never really have an understanding of what the other character's path is. Early on it sounds like the Harrispex is responsible for the deaths of both Simon and Isidore, though some people vouch for his innocence. But then you find out that Isidore is his father. Would he really just kill his dad like that? But then it turns out the plague might have killed those people. As far as you know, anyway. But people seem to be saying he's going around killing people now. They're calling him the Ripper. I'd wondered if maybe you play a serial killer in his plot? When you talk to him, he seems reasonable and like he's trying to make a cure for the plague, a panacea. But both you and Dankowski seem wary of his methods. He's using a kind of medicine that seems kind of folksy and a bit made up, so you kind of ignore it. He's got his own shit to deal with. Something about a guy called Foreman Oyun and what a big problem he poses. Dankowski never even meets that guy, whoever he is. But because he's a trusted member of this culture, you need him to do some stuff for you. For part of the main plot, you have to help break him out of a prison to help you, because the governor doesn't believe he's innocent of all the shit he's heard about him at this point. Basically, when you're playing as the Bachelor, the Harrispex seems a whole lot like a dangerous weirdo whose help you happen to need. But when you're playing as the Harrispex, his side of the story actually starts to make sense. And that kind of asymmetrical storytelling isn't something you tend to get in video games. In keeping with the unsettling and anxiety-inducing design of the rest of the mechanics, the game's dialogue system deliberately frustrates your ability to fully understand understand the story too. 
When you're talking to someone, you often have the chance to ask questions or make observations, but often in a chain of dialogue you can't come back to. There aren't really dialogue trees here. You ask one of several things and that's your lot. Sometimes dialogue choices exit out of the conversation with no way to go back and progress it. The only way to learn absolutely everything you can is to load a lot of quick saves around dialogue or try to only ask questions you think you don't already know the answer to. There is absolutely no way this wasn't intentional. The game wants you to feel trapped in dialogue dialogue, so you have to think carefully about what to ask and if you can trust those answers to ever learn anything, and you can't go back and ask the other without the inconvenience of loading a save. You have to figure out what thing your character should say which won't end the talking if you want to learn more about what's going on, so you learn to talk manipulatively instead of truthfully. Do you really need to tell someone you think their idea is bad when you can play along and learn more? It makes even dialogue somewhat tense, uncertain what option will end the talking. Take into account it's possible to fail quite quests by saying the wrong thing, and you have a great system nestled precisely in the fact it seems unforgiving and incomplete. The system only feels bad if you're trained to expect to be able to go back and learn everything you want, but as we've just spent over 40 minutes covering, the game's about not getting what you want, and hating people for it. One thing that complicates discussions of the writing is the fact that the game has had two English translations now. The first, which came out when the game was released overseas in 2005, was notoriously so strange that some sections of the game are borderline impossible to understand without a guide or a philosophy degree, and some sections were even taken out completely for foreign releases because they just didn't make sense. The HD remaster has a new, improved translation and has the cut parts put back in. It also has new voice recordings, which is good because the last ones weren't great. Your sensitive hands kill more often than present life. You will inevitably cause harm. And this smartass won't consider the losses at all. You both lack mercy. See, that's just not fitting at all. The changeling is an ambiguously magical little girl, not an evil elderly crone witch. Simon, the land has cast out a monster from the bowels to bridle his impudence. Katerina, oh sorry, she's Katharina in this version, is one of those clairvoyants I mentioned earlier, but she's also whacked out on morphine most of the time. This voice really isn't appropriate for her. <laughs> I need morphine. Yeah, that's better. The new vocalists are much more fitting, and better directed, too. They would have had to re-record the vocals anyway because the translation they were going from was pretty bad. For example, there's a cultural term the Harrispex uses a lot to refer to the bachelor, uh, oinon. Go, oinon. I need time to pick up my tools. Um, the original vocalizations... Well, they left a little bit to be desired. Go, onion! I need to collect the tools. This epidemic acts as if it has a mind of its own. This disease behaves as though it has a mind of its own. Yeah, see, maybe they forgot to delete a sentence there, I don't know. Traces of the supernatural are found more often than most reasonable and wise people would like. Uh, I'm not really feeling it. Chimeras that had been... <laughs> Chimeras worship- Okay, that's a little better. That sounds like it might even be a way of saying it. It's Chimera, right? Oh god, I don't even know anymore how to pronounce Chimera. Please be Chimera. Chimera. What? What? Screwed this one up. Needs fixing. That is not how you pronounce Chimera. It sounds like someone machine translated the original Russian script into English, then went through doing right-click thesaurus to make it sound smarter. It's tough to pass, and it really throws me off. Every time a character's side of a conversation turns out to be three lines of this kind of text, my brain groans at me, and I have to pause for a sec to mentally prepare to read it. The game's weird writing was like that in the original game, too. Russians don't walk around talking like this. This is just how it was written. I originally thought this line in the old translation Translation, immortal dragon was weird, like they were trying to refer to Simon as a mythological creature but accidentally refer to him as a creature that we have a lot of visual connotations for. <coughs> the new one says Leviathan, which seems more appropriate. If you call someone a Leviathan, it sounds metaphorical and less literal. But I checked, and the original Russian version calls him an immortal dragon too! And dragon doesn't have any special metaphorical meaning in Russian, it just means dragon. It's just a weirdly written game that the old translation makes even weirder by taking it way too literally. But there's an interesting intersection going Going on here. You see, while the translation is improved, at least in my opinion, the sense of strangeness in the unforgiving and alien culture of the strange town was completely intended. Some people actually defend the older translation for adding to this feel. Like, some people will actually say that the worst translation is better at getting across the feel the game is going for. Now we're going to get into some subjective territory here. We're going to have to peel away a few 
layers of the onion of interpretation. But while I can see that argument, I... Phony! You're a fucking phony! Okay, fine. I have something embarrassing to admit about my relationship with this game, which really throws my pretentious hipster credentials into question. Are you telling him you're a phony yet? Yeah, I'm doing it now! Are you doing it? Y I'm doing it! Are you doing it? Get out of my fucking video! You see, I have two failed prior attempts to make it through this game. In 2013, I found the Rock Paper Shotgun articles by Quentin Smith, hallowed be his name, and found them really convincing on the subject of how games could be. They really opened my eyes and changed how I think about gaming, so I decided to try the game for myself. The original translation bounced me right off. It was a little too much for me to want to sit down and put time into when I bought it in 2013 and had a degree to pretend to work for and Gundam to watch, and I actually took a picture on my phone of the funniest thing about this experience, which was when the most understandable sentence I'd read so far was a character apologising for if they don't make much sense. I was like, yeah, thanks. So I stopped. Then, a couple of years later, I tried again, pushed past my initial problems, hated being alone with my thoughts when I was walking around the town, because most of my thoughts were about how good Turn A Gundam was, and basically did such a bad job I was dying over and over on day two and realised I'd have to go back, and gave up. So, I spent years agreeing with critics, convinced of their arguments that games could do more things than be viscerally entertaining or mechanically fun, despite failing to play the central game many used in their example of the value of negative experiences. It was too negative for me, apparently. Only now, with the HD edition and the new translation, did I finally stick with it long enough to truly enter into the experience. And I'm glad I finally got to do that. And I think I really needed the better translation to help bring me in. That older version probably has its charms, and I'm sure it must considering the game had defenders for almost a decade before the fixed version came out, but it was certainly too much for me. However, even the new and improved version of the game still has its problems. We've already covered aspects of the game that are just not gonna be for everyone, the slow pace, the tone, the feel of the gameplay and mechanics. Now let's talk about the actual problems. Part 4 the jank. One thing that's absolutely necessary to successfully progressing the story is to read your mail. You get letters from people over the course of the day, and the only way to know you get them is to know you get them. And the only way to read them is to hit the L key on your keyboard to open up the letters menu. The game doesn't tell you this. The game's tutorial, amazing in its own way as it is, fails to tell you one of the most critical things you need to know. If you don't read your mail, you straight up will not know what to do on some days. And as far as I can tell, nothing in the game tells you unless you check your keyboard options. This is a huge oversight. The game does do interesting things with not giving you proper information, like it never tells you that food prices are about to ruin your life, or it doesn't tell you that some of your quests will end in disaster and you maybe shouldn't have bothered or run away with the money. And if someone's not going to get to those moments because they didn't understand what they were supposed to be doing, or got annoyed they hadn't even been told a core feature by the game, it's a genuine flaw. Speaking of the flaw... Hear that thud? When you have too many items in your inventory, the item drops on the ground in a bag and you have to drop something else to pick it up. If this is a plot important item, not hearing that and looking down to swap something out could cause a lot of problems. <laughs> I think the game could have done a much better job of letting you know when you don't have room for something. This is a section from the Changeling story later on. I can't pick up this bag because my inventory is full, but the game has no way of telling me. So I'm just sitting here getting stabbed to death and then I have to load a save and drop something in order to pick this up. This isn't as critical, but it showcases the problem in a funny way. If you sneak up on a rat instead of letting them see you and chase you, you can pick them up and actually use them in rat races later on. But if your inventory is full, they just turn into a bag with a rat in it. If you can't progress the story because you dropped something, or you're too busy micromanaging what's in your inventory in case you get given something important, then you're being made to miss out on what's good about the game by a poorly implemented mechanic. Pathologic is already not for everybody, and the mechanical stuff like this only detract. Oh fuck! The mechanical stuff like this only detracts from what makes it truly unique. There's a lot of jank in the game. AI bugs out if you stand in the wrong place during fights, spins in circles or stands still and waits to die, you can get stuck in level geometry sometimes, the physics like to explode. The thing is, a lot of these sorts of problems are a result of the game existing at all. Like, you could spend a ton of man hours making the AI work perfectly in fights that aren't on completely flat ground, or you can get the game out before your team goes bust. And in many ways, much like I Divine Cybermancy or Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, the bugs are a good thing. They're 
they're a reminder of how much bloody work it took to whip this thing into existence with the available tools. I still shudder when I think about how to get the Source engine to do things I or Vampire did, and Pathologic's engine seems like it was made out of whole cloth. Do you have any idea how hard that is? Video games are hard to program. It takes years of work to make something good. Games, as a rule, even the stable looking ones, are usually at their core hugely hacked together to barely do whatever they do, and even what seems like simple, slight changes run the risk of absolutely obliterating everything you hold dear. So a lot of the game's weakest aspects feel like a compromise for the inability or instability of the engine. In the story, for example, sometimes characters interact. They talk or get one another to do things, but while you're present, characters are never doing anything. They're just standing where they're supposed to be standing and you go over and talk to them and you get the impression they're in the middle of doing it or taking a break or something. Sometimes characters meet up to discuss something or get attacked by soldiers and escape, but it's always just happened when you walk in and everything's already over whenever you're there. It's not super immersion breaking, but a little more interaction or being able to watch the characters do the things you're told they did might have been nice. Also, characters sharing a space together don't seem to regard each other. They either do their idle animation and occasionally say lines like they normally do just next to each other. Yes. Your face what is, is there to talk away. about now? Are you sick or something? How's my brother? Any news on him? Or they're completely frozen in place. You never even get to watch a conversation between two characters. Even when they're in the same room, you talk to each of them separately. Again, these aren't things I would really criticize the game for. These are reflective of the absolutely minuscule amount of budget and time the developers had, and the limitations of their engine. These are things that it would have been nice to see working better, but aren't a huge problem when you're actually playing. There's other technical problems too. There's this weird bug where the screen's entire color palette shifts when certain effects are playing like fires or blood splatters during combat. I'm sure there's a fix for this, but I decided to just live with it. It felt in the spirit of things to do that, but it's still very distracting and definitely not intentional. All in all, all the little things like this contribute to the overall feeling that the creators had lofty ideas for their story and world full of characters to interact with and environments to explore, but were limited in what they could accomplish. However, it's important not to confuse limitation with artistic choice, because some things in the game are easy to dismiss as problems, but work in the context of the story that's being told and the overall effect being attempted. On that note, we haven't really talked about the graphics yet. Visually, even for the time, the game was regarded as pretty ugly. Everything is a weird, angular facsimile of what it's supposed to be. The colour palette is drab. Infected and dying districts tint things even uglier shades, and all the minor NPCs look the same as each other. However, I think that ugliness was deliberate and actually serves a purpose. Oh no, it's the pretentious police! They found me! <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ! The game is set in a dying rural town. The sky is never clear, everyone's sick, everything is depressing, and the filters that turn up in infected areas make everything even more sickly. The fairly low texture detail and polygon count do end up contributing to this look and feel in their own way. By being not much to look at, the downer tone set by the story and mechanics isn't thrown away by looking pretty. The game's art design when it comes to characters or the more interesting locations is imaginative enough that even even if it doesn't look visually great, you can see what they're going for and understand what it's supposed to be, at least. So, at least in my opinion, the art style contributes to the feel. I think it works that it looks like this and not other ways, but I'm not sure if I'm happy with saying that, because if the game had looked better, like if it was on par with Half-Life 2, I don't think I'd have been saying, this should have looked worse, would I? It's one of those things where, because it works well enough for what it is, I don't feel a need to complain that the graphics are bad, even though obviously they could be better. People can decide for themselves where the experience is improved or worsened by things like bugs or inventory stuff or the combat or graphics or translation, and ultimately the game is what you get out of it. And for some people, the line of what makes a game good is very far away from anything any version of this game is doing. It's completely understandable why some people don't engage with the game or want to and bounce off it. I certainly did that the first two times, so I can respect that. Like I said, it's not fun. I can't really recommend you play it. That's why I'm here sharing what I think is interesting about the experience and not telling you to play it for yourself. I suffered, so you didn't have to. Once you get over the initial humps and learn to deal with the difficult elements, cope with the survival mechanics and get good at walking, 
Wow, what a phrase. Get good at walking. Learn to do a repetitive, unsatisfying thing on your way to a goal. Walking in Pathologic reminds me a little bit of doing exercise or cleaning my kitchen. It's not fun, but it's important to learn how to do it. Or the empty cans of kidney beans that still have some juice and a bean or two in them you left on the side to figure out which bin to throw them out in start to smell after getting left there for a week and a half. That's not a real story. Once you figure out what the game is demanding of you, it doesn't stay as difficult as it seems. I think people tend to overstate the game's unpleasantness when it's not a constant, it's just an early spike as it teaches you what the experience is going to be like. Once you get into the swing of things, The Bachelor is a cakewalk, but without the cake. I mean, you aren't exactly given no help. Almost everyone important trusts The Bachelor, and he starts out with some useful items, a weapon, decent money, some medicine, and he can make a whole lot more during the game doing quests for the rich people who trust him. It is possible to get on top of the game's economy and survival mechanics as The Bachelor. It gets hard at times, and even harder if you insist on doing the good guy things in quests, like not running away with all the money or food you bought for that one quest, or giving away literally all the money you have saving six random people from getting wrongly executed, which I didn't do. I loaded my save after this cutscene played and kept the money and I'm a bad person for it. But even if you do all the good guy things, if you know what you're doing and take the opportunities that are given to you, you can make it through alive even while being a good person. The Bachelor's story is technically quite hard, but ultimately forgiving. It's a pretty balanced experience all in all. Anyway, the Harrispex's story begins with you bleeding to death. Upon arriving at his hometown via the train station after 10 years away studying surgery, the Harrispex, Artemi Burak, has been stabbed repeatedly in a fight with multiple people who believed him to be a murderer trying to escape via the station. Artemi's just got here and he's already bleeding out while wanted for his own father's murder. And this isn't just a cutscene that happens before the game starts. Oh no. You begin the game at the train station, surrounded by corpses with your health low, your reputation even lower, and your hunger and exhaustion meter's already half full. Now, if you were wondering why the Harrispex did what he did in his playthrough, here's the first of many reasons why. It turns out that for Artemy, everything was fucked all the time. Yeah, sure, the Bachelor playthrough was pretty hard. You maybe even figured out how to play it and not die too much. I bet you thought you were good at this game. That's where you're wrong. Daniil Dankowski's fun step vacation was just the tutorial for Artemi Burak's tormentous nightmare. Some people refer to playing the Harrispex as hard mode, and I must admit, at the beginning it is a little bit like getting stabbed in the dick, but after that it gets much worse. Remember that horrifying moral quandary as Dankowski where you could risk six innocent people getting executed if you choose not to get involved in something that isn't your business anyway? The Harrispex has a moral quandary a million billion times harder, and it's his first quest. After getting chased into the warehouse territory by an angry mob, you go inside and meet a gang of children. This gang was there in the Bachelor's playthrough, but you only really visited them like once. They weren't really very interested in talking to you, and the Bachelor was too busy sucking up to the important people to care about a bunch of children. When you talk to Notkin, their leader, he says they have a rebel who stole something from them to defect to a rival gang. He says if you do him the favor of killing them for him, he'll give you a gun and some ammo. Now, I don't want to tip your hand as to whether that might be a useful item to have in this playthrough, but as soon as I left the building, a man tried to beat me to death. Remember that reputation mechanic? It turns out that when it's low enough, in addition to shopkeepers not trading with you, all regular NPCs will attack you in the street. Oh, and because these people are just law-abiding citizens attacking a wanted criminal, killing them in self-defense is a crime, and your reputation will drop even further. <sighs> So either you run away to preserve what reputation you have left and try to do good things to correct it, or fight back and make everything worse. Good luck, fucker! Have those guys seen me? Yep, they've seen me. I feel very seen right now. Since fighting is more of a fact of the Harrispex's short life, yeah, having a gun would really help with that. So you go out into the step and... Oh. Oh, fuck off. Of course, this was a gang of children. Of course the rebel member is a kid. So you can tell him off and send him on his way for a minuscule reputation boost. And if you kill him, it drops a bunch because, you know, you've killed a child. But your reputation already can't get much worse, and Notkin's offer of a gun is a pretty big deal. And this kid has a schmowder on him. It's one of the critical items. It's basically the one thing in the game you can't pass up an opportunity to get. Plus, he's in a gang, so he knew the risks. 
So you can get a gun super early on in Artemis playthrough, but at a significant moral cost. Obviously the kid is just polygons, but if you take the role playing seriously, or even just stop for a moment and ask yourself if you would do this in real life if it meant survival, there's a lot of feelings to unpack here. I mean, let's recap. In many modern RPGs, child murder is still a thing that won't even go on the table. Get on the fucking table, MacReady! Oh, I'll be back for you in Fallout 4, fucker, when you're old enough to die! In Pathologic, one of the most taboo things there is in gaming is one character's first quest, and there's significant personal justification for going through with it. You are dying, and you need the stuff you get for it desperately. You just have to find a way to live with the fact that you are now wanted for a murder you definitely did commit along with the one murder you didn't. Now, it's not all bad for the Harrispex. Okay, it is, but he gets one thing. As a Menku, he can also dissect corpses, a thing the Bachelor had to get you out of prison to do for him. Every corpse you come across carries a heart, a liver, one kidney, I don't know, just go with it, and some blood. These grisly items form a new kind of currency. Various characters in the game will trade you really useful stuff for these, opening up an entirely new black market economy. Characters who wouldn't even talk to the Bachelor are now an extra tool for survival if you know where to look. Give me the herbs, worm. Artemis' father's secret lab has tools to make medicines that can raise immunity and lower infection super easily, making him infinitely more survivable when it comes to the plague than Dankowski if you put effort into perfecting the recipes. They work like the medicine you've used before, but much stronger and with much less downsides if you get them right. I really like the asymmetrical storytelling that's happening with this aspect of the gameplay. Not only is it just an extra layer of fun stuff to learn and master to survive in the town and it feels good getting it right, but you're also seeing the sides of the world that Dankowski's beliefs just denied him access to. He thought that this medicine was made up, and here it is keeping you alive. Even if you get infected as Artemy, and actually it's really hard not to as him, it's much less of a problem because of all these herbal remedies you've got. But that's about it. So you're fucked, but once the plague becomes a problem you can live long enough to be killed by something else. Like this great bit where as soon as you leave a building it spawns two muggers outside and they both throw knives at you which kills you instantly! At the very least, if you have to defend yourself and lower your rep, you get to keep whatever was in their pockets, and their meat pockets, and with the new economy maybe not being accepted by society isn't as much of a death sentence. I really do feel like Barak doesn't enjoy unnecessary violence. He's an educated man, he seems quite noble in a way. He wouldn't do it if he didn't have to. It's unbecoming of his station- wait, does that guy have a shotgun? Oh. <laughs> Getting a shotgun. One second. Gimme 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 gimme. Getting a shotgun on day one feels a little broken after how late I got one as the bachelor. But what makes it extra engaging is the knowledge that I'll probably need it. Selling weapons as the Harris Banks is even more nail biting than before. Just because of the way his campaign is set up, you will need everything you could buy with that money even more desperately than before. But you also kind of need the g what? Come on, what the fuck? There's five guys? So it's about now that I realized why Artemy ended up with his reputation as the Ripper. He was in a desperate place, so he was forced to make difficult decisions. And the few options available to him involve getting his hands dirty. The story makes a lot of sense now. He wasn't a serial killer. He was a guy who was in the wrong place at the wrong time and has to fight to survive and solve his own father's murder and maybe help the town, and one of his skills happens to be surgical ability. Luckily there are some chances to redeem yourself. You hear one of your attackers from the opening got away and is bleeding out in the graveyard. This guy needs a blood transfusion, and if I save his life maybe he'll help clear my name. So you traipse all the way across the entire town to get to the hunchback who will draw some of your blood for you if you have enough health to spare. Pick it up! Don't forget to pick it up this time or you'll have to come all the way back again! And then take a long stroll all the way back. Did I say stroll? I meant to say seven guys are chasing me. Oh god, stop it! Leave me alone! I'm a good person, it's just a misunderstanding! Oh thank god, a sewing needle! Hey kid, take it, thanks for the medicine, I'll be needing that. Anyway, back to being chased. The walking in the easy mode, the Bachelor's playthrough, was pretty tense at the best of times, but now it's an active fight for survival. Leave me alone, please! Just let me do a good thing! Why don't you try walking a mile in my shoes? You know what? Don't put your feet anywhere near my shoes. You can all put back both of your feet in the grave. Look, don't criticize my one-liner, okay? I'm under a lot of stress. Ooh, a lemon.
And blood transfusion. I did it! I saved a life! Yay! Now I'm well on my way to clearing my name. And I'm only mostly poor and exhausted and hungry and dead. Fuck! So remember the perspective thing I talked about? The Harrispex, as a former local of this culture, is trusted by the people who hate The Bachelor and spends a lot more time in places The Bachelor only got to go once and then got the shit kicked out of him for going to. Oh yes, fucking get him, mate, yeah! <laughs> so you see a completely different side of the story, and of the town since you spend time being public enemy number one. The reputation mechanics basically didn't come up in The Bachelor's run unless you killed people for no reason, but now you have to face the problems having a low one poses and build it back up to survive. It's hyper-engaging, not just because it's hard, but because you remember how it was before. It's the same conjuring trick as Day 2's food shortage. Everything is different and scary all over again. I love it. It's hard, it's punishing, arguably it's incredibly unfair, but I love it. You learn more about aspects of the plot the town jester had no idea about. For example, you are the reason the Stomatins never turned up on day two when cowardly little Dankowski tried to flee the town. Maria found out about the plan and got you to convince them to stay by telling them you'd invented some cool new alcohol. The Stomatins are really into the local drink, Twirene, an absinthe-like spirit with possibly magical properties, and your medicines actually are derived from the same ingredients which you can trade with Andre for great stuff. And then, just to keep you on your toes, once you get your reputation sorted, a few days later it all happens again. You get captured by Sabarov's men and thrown in jail, just like you did in Daniel's story. And here's where another aspect of the multi-character structure becomes clear by actively fucking you. When you aren't in control of a character, they make worse decisions than you did. When you talk to him, he talks like the worst of the options you could have chosen. He's naturally more of a dick. He even says random Latin phrases at you. It's great. I love this prickly little prick. He's just so well characterized, and I love how much the game hammers home what an idiot he is in this version of the story. The big city guest jumps the gun too much. Not the mystery solving type, really. But he doesn't know our traditions. He's bound to be deceived. Even the plays that you can go see call Dankovsky a piece of shit. All in all, we can fight. You self-serving jerk. Dankovsky believes the disease came from the wells. He's wrong. But more importantly, he never stages a prison break. You have to break yourself out. Then, later in the game, he fucks up a quest you did easily when you were playing as him, and then you have to break him out of prison. Nice going, Dankovsky. Okay, okay, fine. Don't panic, I'll bargain for your release. 30 clips of rifle ammo? Listen, there's a plague going on? We're kind of on the clock here, and I'm not giving bullets to a gang of violent kids. Someone could get hurt. I did it! I saved the bachelor! The Harrispex's main quests are to develop a panacea, an actual cure for the plague, to figure out who killed his father, obviously, and to assume his father's duties in the kin, the people of the steppe. To do this, he gets to go into the abattoir and talk a lot with Foreman Oyun, the guy who's currently in charge and the bachelor barely heard anything about, and who is also bad at his job and everyone hates and wants you to replace him. He starts giving you trials to prove your worth. Two of these trials are he gives you a poison and you have to do something for him before you die of it. I'm not going to say the trials are just tricks to try and kill you, but I don't know. Mm. The final trial is to jump into a big hole and die. Uh. I'm not really sure about this one, Chief. He says it's a spiritual experience, and your father did this too to take his place in the kin, but no one else says anything about any trials. By the way, uh, if you jump in the hole, you die. There is a spiritual aspect to Artemy's life in the town, though. When you're walking around out in the steppe, you can hear a cool, distant chanting now. <laughs> The character later tells you the voice you're hearing is your father's voice. That's really cool. You feel more in touch with the land in his story, and you kind of are. 
Artemis' medicines are made from plants that grow in the town, and he can actually pick them up when he sees them around the place. The wide open, empty space you felt was kind of meaningless as the bachelor is suddenly rife with items that can help you. You start to literally see the town differently as the Harrisbex, and that's just incredibly cool. All the least fun bits of the first playthrough are ramped up to 11. The walking is even more excruciating and circular. The survival mechanics are harder on account of having no money and low reputation a lot of the time and not having as many rich friends. Many of the quests are deliberate in-story attempts to waste your time and get you killed by Foreman Oyun, but you're invested now. The suffering is engaging, and you want to know what happens, how it all shakes out for him. You take the hours of walking in stride, haha. <laughs> you see all the efforts you go to as proof that you're willing to go through hell and high water to save this town. If you didn't like this game, you wouldn't get to this point anyway, but if you somehow did, it's excruciating, it's awful, you're having a shit time being bored, but if you care about the story, if you've got immersed in the atmosphere and are engaged fully with the survival mechanics and your understanding of how much harder things are now, this is the best fucking time I've had in a game in years. It's still not fun. It's something else. This other thing I can't even describe. It's satisfying in a way I'm not used to games being. In a way, the game is asking you a serious question about whether you're willing to be punished to succeed. If you give up and close the game and stop playing it, you're basically letting the town die without your help, aren't you? Oh Yoon is trying to make you give up and stop playing, and I'm not gonna let him. I'm gonna solve this shit, and I'm gonna cure the town. Just remember to pick up the quest items that drop at your feet, or you have to come all the fucking way back again. You also learn how badly you'd accidentally messed a lot of things up as the Bachelor without even knowing it. Late in the game, when you've learned a lot of the mystery and figured out at last how to make a cure for the plague, but only in extremely limited quantities whose source ingredient is almost impossible to get, there's one side quest where a giant bull mysteriously appears, stuck to a giant stake. The giant bull's blood can be used as a source of the cure. You get some from the bull and make arrangements to get it pulled off the stake and rescued properly the next day, which might even give you enough to save the whole town. Then you remember that when you were the bachelor, there was a side quest featuring a staked bull surrounded by people, which was a clear health hazard. What if people congregating like that spreads the plague? Or what if they're planning a riot? So you nonchalantly ordered the bull to be burned and thought nothing of it. Dankowski, you prickly prick, you've buried us all! So make the most of the blood you got the day before, because that's all you're getting! In any case, the Harrispex run is a spectacular playthrough. It's excellently designed. It forces you to relate to mechanics you felt like you knew, but in even more knuckle-tightening ways. And every time you get one over on the world or Oyun and survive to the next day having learned more, it feels like a genuine victory. Having an in-depth understanding of the layout and purpose of each part of the town, and then getting to be a fugitive from the law in it is so cool. You get to see your previous character how other people saw him instead of how you probably felt while playing as him. You learn more about the mysteries of the town from a second perspective, and you finally have something of an idea of how everything slots together. All the problems the game has are even more glaring after another 20 hours of playing a story in it, but I had an even better time as the Harrisbex overall, and I'm glad I sat through the grim, bloody nightmare of the story to the end. The bitterest end. Destruction is inevitable. There's no miraculous way out. There was nothing to hope for from the start. I can't really talk about Pathologic without showing you how it all shakes out. It's too cool not to talk about. By the final days, the town is a war zone. An Inquisitor and later the army have shown up to try to get things under control, but the commander hates the Inquisitor and they won't work with each other. He loses control of a bunch of his troops, half of them die of the plague themselves, and all they've really added to the proceedings is now the army's shooting the diseased in the street. So I really hope that you have medicine, because if you get too infected, god this last section is hard. Actually, here's a weird thing. If you get hit by the flamethrower, it does a ton of damage, but it also reduces your infection level. I think it's meant to be a metaphor for burning out your infection. Usually this kills you. But due to a bug, if you somehow survive the fire because you got out of dodge super quick and had a lot of health, if it reduces your infection past zero, it cures you of the disease. Hey, thanks for that, you little fucker! <laughs> The disease itself is chasing you down in an evolved, even faster form that looks like angels made of blood. It's a nightmare. The army's brought a giant cannon and has orders to shell the entire area to the ground to prevent the plague from spreading if it comes to that, and it is coming to that. However, after a lot of false starts and internal politicking and generally getting messed around, your characters manage to find a solution to the plague. 
The trouble is, each character finds their own solution. The Bachelor has helped develop a vaccine which can protect the healthy from getting infected, and falls in with the Canes, the utopian academics and elites who helped develop the Polyhedron, the impossible structure next to their house that has kept most of the town's children safe inside, and may now house Simon's soul. It's a marvellous, miraculous thing that heralds a new and beautiful future. He also comes to think the town is a lost cause. He's sick of the babblings of its people whose customs have prevented him from helping them. Over the course of the game, the Bachelor's map of the town evolves as he learns new things and gets more and more disillusioned with his quest. To the Bachelor, the town is an ugly and disgusting thing, crammed on a hill where it shouldn't, with its blood and darkness seeping into the soil, and eventually the beautiful, mathematical polyhedron joins it, a wonderful thing skewering through the dark earth and its corrupted blood, bigger and more important than anything else. He believes at this point the plague is caused by the backwater people's unsanitary practices causing animal blood to congeal in the earth for thousands of years. The Bachelor wants the Commander to shell the town, destroying it and the plague, and freeing the Polyhedron of its corruption, leaving the survivors to build a new town on the other side of the river governed by the visionary Canes. If the Bachelor gets his way, he really did bury them all. The Harrispex, however, is a local of the town and has gotten more involved in the internal struggles, assumed his rightful place as the leader of the kin, and finally gained access to the source of blood he can use to make a panacea and cure the infected, a step closer to defeating the disease than the Bachelor's vaccine. He manages this after a, let's say, mildly tedious final boss fight with the foreman. Yeah, the Harrispex run has a final boss fight in it? Punch him 30 times and he does a quarter of your health each hit. You finally get your revenge on the man who, it turns out, out, killed your father. His map screen evolves as he learns too, portraying the town as built on the back of a giant bull, with the veins of the world portraying the town as a gigantic organism. Then the polyhedron appears, tearing through the veins, injuring the earth itself. Blood pools at the base of the tower, myopic dreams of utopia scraping a nightmarish wound into the earth. To the Harrispex, the polyhedron caused the plague, and it should be destroyed, so the town can heal. I like these two divergent climaxes. Both characters have such different perspectives and experiences that you can see how they came to the conclusions they did, and it highlights their differing philosophies about the world and how to live in it. Dankowski wants to transcend the flesh, to defeat death itself, to build wonderful and impossible things. He doesn't really care about average people. He feels like he's too important for them. He doesn't even like them, really. His ultimate medicine prevents infection, shields you from the plague, but doesn't actually stop it killing the people it gets to. An ounce of prevention might be worth a pound of cure, but what about all the people who need curing? They get written off, not just by his version of medicine, but the town itself has to die for him to be certain the plague is dead with it. He'd rather destroy something than risk it spreading the disease, a mistake that actually helped doom the creation of more actual cures. Every choice he made was understandable, and yet it was never enough to actually save most of the people of the town. Artemy is a polar opposite. He's more concerned with curing the sick than protecting the healthy. He gets down in the dirt, the bowels of the earth, and makes tough sacrifices, even killing innocent people, but he does it compassionately to try to end the suffering for real. And protecting the townspeople means protecting them from the high-minded idealism that led to the negligence that failed to prevent the plague early on, and invented the structure that caused it all in the first place. A lot of this stuff is very ambiguous, there's a lot of ways of looking at it, but at least in my interpretation, the game seems very concerned with the tensions between the utopian dream of a better world and the actual people who have to build it and live through the follies that come with these projects. It's hard not to notice this Russian game's parallels with the history of the Soviet Union. As for the Changeling, Ah, oh, I can't be bothered. I mean, come on, do I really need to do a third 20-hour playthrough and then explain all of that? I'm sure nothing that interesting happens in it. These endings don't just happen on their own, however. Left to its own devices, at the end of the twelfth day, the army destroys everything and the bad ending happens. In order for your character to successfully get their ending, none of their bound can be sick. They have to prove that they're a good doctor, which means doing the main quest on time every day, and if you didn't, you have to cure the ones that got sick. You can do this by using the panaceas or schmauders you found over the course of the run, so if you didn't use them yourself or sell them for tons of cash, they're a kind of get out of bad ending free card per person who got ill. If you prove you've done your duty as a doctor, you're let into the cathedral to argue your case, and when the day ends, you get your character's ending. 
Yay! The end. But on the same day, you also get letters from the other two characters. They both still have their own ideas for what needs to be done about the plague, but because you weren't in control of them, they kept messing up. Their plotlines weren't quite as successful as they could have been, and a bunch of their bound caught the plague. They plead with you to help cure them so they can argue their case too, and if you cure all of them, you can invite them to the cathedral and actually pick their ending instead of yours. You can tell the commander to go with someone else's idea if you get them a seat at the table. Then you get their ending instead, and in the classic HD edition, you get an achievement for it. That's nice. You get that ending instead. Cool. But if you do manage to invite someone else, something else happens too. You get a letter from the powers that be, inviting you to the polyhedron. You only go there like twice as the bachelor and once as the Harrispex, and you never go very far in. Only those with young, unsullied, creative minds can see it for more than a series of small rooms. This time you can descend to the very bottom to meet the gods of the world. Major spoilers from here on out, folks. This is the secret shit half the people who finished the game never even learn. Here we go. That model looks a whole lot like the town with the polyhedron sticking out, doesn't it? Oh, fuck! It is the town! You're in a garden, and two giant children are there, surprised that their doll has come to life. The town, everyone in it, and the plague are just an imaginary story told by two kids in a sandbox. They tell you you're a toy, and you can complain about your fate and how unfair being not real is at them, but it's all futile. You can't change anything. They're kids playing God, and you were their imaginary friend. A doll who briefly got to question his masters before returning to the game. So, uh... This ending is pretty divisive, to say the least. It really annoyed some people. There's plenty of posts out there about how much it messes with them. This happens 20 to 30 hours into a story you've been super engrossed in, and if you do really good at the story, the secret extra revelation is that none of it was real. It was all in vain. In fact, as Dankowski, your mission statement finally changes here to tell you it was all in vain. After a whole game of staring at Dankowski's quest to defeat death, it finally changes to acknowledge all his quests were always pointless. He was never even real. I mean, this is equivalent to a movie all turning out to be a dream. It's a bit of a kick in the teeth, honestly. In a way, it's the ultimate depressing move, to have worked this hard and suffered so much, and then to be told you were just a toy. It's so much, so mean, and yet, it's exactly what Pathologic has been doing the whole time. Even right at the end, they still managed to hurt you one last time. But guess what? There's an even more secret ending! There's an even twistier fucking twist! If you saved both other characters bound, which as either character is hard as hell since it requires all the panaceas you can possibly get in their quests and the couple schmouders you can get, which, let me remind you, requires child murder, plus maybe a few extras from trading with this kid who barely turns up and rarely has a schmouder to trade for anyway, she wants like seven flowers for it too. I got one from her in 20 hours playing The Bachelor, and no, this isn't even even the clip of me finding it, I can't remember where it is because there's like 23 hours of footage! Once you're done with the dog shit revelation offered by the powers that be, you get a second letter from the people who executed the whole thing, inviting you to the theatre. The theatre, the place you started. It always meant something, and now it's going to show you what. Remember the first time you got to the end of the impossible quiz and it turned out you had to have kept all the skips? That's how getting here and realizing I needed to have never used any of these things was. I'm glad I didn't, but wow! They give you cures to the status effect that threatens you the most in the whole game, and the only way to truly win is to never use any and save them up for the end. And they don't even tell you you were supposed to do this. It's genius, because it's so fucking mean. I mean, it's just... Ah... Oh. Pathologic, man. This close to the end, with the town ghostly and empty, awaiting the time of my final decision, getting a last minute secret invitation from the figures behind everything, even more behind everything than the gods who made the world, is so mysterious and satisfying and amazing. I can't tell you how cool that last trip from the polyhedron to the theatre was. In a town with no more dangers, no more threats, just me and the empty world, the walk to the theatre is the most amazing journey of all. Are these the same guys from the tutorial? The ones no one but me could even see? Oh my god. 
These aren't the people behind the events. Well, they are, but they're more than that. These are the developers of the game. Holy shit. The final secret is a chat with the developers. The first thing they do is point out the children aren't real either. And I mean, they're right too. None of this is real. Why would you be annoyed by the it's all a game played by children twist ending? It is all a game. You always knew that. You're literally playing a game. The whole point is that games feel real even though they aren't. That's what suspension of disbelief is. You never really believe a game is real, but you briefly pretend you don't not believe to engage with it. And the game gave you a shitty twist just to make you wonder why that twist hurts when it's just telling you something you already knew. God, what a cool double twist. I love this so much. You even get to pick whether to talk as the character or as yourself. God, this is cool. In reality, all games are a conversation between you and the developers. All Pathologic does is rip down the curtain at the end and show you that's what it was and tell you that's okay. It's fun to spend time in a world someone else made for you. It never had to be real to be real. Oh God, forgive me if my speech is unclear or absurd. I'm still reeling from this. Even writing the script after playing the game and even saying it now, I'm just, ah, oh, I love this. I can't even communicate it. And that's what I've been trying to do for tens of thousands of words now. It's so good. Anyway, time to go pick my ending. You can say a final goodbye to a bunch of the main characters on the last day and talk about what might happen next. Each of your bound has a thing to say to you. As the Harrispex, if you got to meet the creators, you can taunt the Inquisitor as the player with the knowledge that she's all pretend. And as the Bachelor, hey Changeling, you've been weird and talking about how transcendent and special you are this whole time, but did you know this is all just a game played by children? Wait, what? She knows? She knows? How long has she known? What the fuck was happening in the Changeling story? So, it's all about trickery to you? No, no. I detest trickery. But if we ourselves are to suffer deception, our hands are no longer tied. Clara begins by waking up in a shallow grave. The executors tell you you're going to be mistaken for a murderer and a thief, but also a miracle worker, and your reputation is always going to drop. Clara is immediately adopted by Katerina Sabarov, the semi-magical lady and wife of the governor. She sees her appearance as a sign of divine providence who will do great things for the town and believes you have magical healing powers. You also hear that someone with your description is thought of as a thief in the town and someone matching your appearance was said to have killed Simon or Isidore. Clara replies, yes, she is a good person and the bad things she'd heard must have been her identical twin sister. Huh. Is that an in-character fact about us? Or did our character just tell a lie? Well, it's both. How is that possible? Fuck you! The Sabarovs task Clara with proving she has healing powers. You hear there's been some violence out in the steppe. Some guys tried to stop a murderer escaping the town and got fucked up. That sounds weirdly familiar. And while you're there, you probably get into a fight with the looters. And here's where you find out Clara's combat is hilariously terrible. I mean that literally. I was cackling when I discovered how shit this is. Clara doesn't have a fist fighting animation. Instead, she kind of waves her hands around all magic-like. It's a very slow attack and it does even less damage than the previous character's attacks. Oh, and she has tiny hands so she can't use any weapons or guns except for one shitty gun that sucks. So good luck in fights as Clara. 45 hours and two earth shadows revelations in and the game's still finding ways to destroy me. This is the devs saying, okay, we know you've probably figured out how to fight in this game now, so what if it was even harder? From any kind of typical design standpoint, this combat is horrendous, but it works because at this point you know the developers are just messing with you for fun. It's like when a close friend is rude to you but in a cute way you both think is funny. That's the kind of friendship you have with the developers now. I mean, to even get here, you might have even met them already. You then find the injured man you're supposed to save, and you find out it's not a man, it's, hey, remember this guy? In this version of the story, the Harrispex tried to kill the kid, and the kid was injured but got away. Because, you know, he's not as good at stuff when you're not in control, that sort of thing. From the kid's perspective, and Clara's, he's a monster who tried to kill a kid, but from being the Harrispex, you know what was on the line. It's cool storytelling. You see Artemis' side, but you also have to recognize that he's far from an innocent man here. Luckily, he doesn't have as much blood on his hands this time, it seems, especially since we're going to help the boy. Anyway, you lay on your hands to heal the kid and complete the quest for- Oh, he's dead! 
So Clara's powers, if she has them at all, don't seem to quite work how you expect, at least not for healing traditional wounds. The man who was supposed to serve as a witness to your healing hands, far from assuming you're a charlatan or a demon or a murderer, actually still believes you're a hero though. He decides the kid had been judged by your power as a sinner and then killed instead of healed. He thinks your power is the divine working through you in mysterious ways. Consider yourself purified. You still have to prove you can heal people, but he's basically so sold on you as a divine being. I'm not sure how to feel about this version of the story, in a really good way. Harrispex made a very tough choice and had to live with it, but I think it might actually be even more bleak to have a story where a character tries to heal the child of their wounds, accidentally kills them, and is heralded as a miraculous hero anyway. I love this stuff, it's horrible. It makes my skin crawl. With the harder fighting and the constantly lowering reputation you have to actively keep up by doing good things, the game is pathologic at its most pathologicist. You have to do good things all the time. Give money away, give up on your medicine, kill baddies with your awful attacks and so on. Bachelor has a hard spike on day two, and Harrispex has two hard spikes at the beginning and partway through when he gets captured, but Clara is constantly swimming against a current of negative press. Someone who looks exactly like her has done a lot of bad things. You have a new set of bound, of course, all the remaining main characters who weren't in the first two's care. As always, your job is to protect them from getting infected or dying. Wait, the foreman of the abattoir? Oh, that's not gonna end well. Clara's story has a lot of little extra things in it to learn about character relationships and choices. Lots of them are too small to go into depth about, but at times it was like a victory lap. The writers creating an extra post playthrough story for a character with a magical ability that justifies them learning all kinds of new things. It's another way of exploring the richness of the story. You're still interacting with and causing the story to play out the way it does, but you have the strongest idea of why it all worked out now with two stories worth of hindsight. When you talk to the foreman who gave the Harrispex so much trouble and help him verify Artemy is a legitimate heir to his position, this conversation causes him to devise the trials he tormented you with when you were playing the other story. He comes up with them on purpose to get rid of Artemy. Thanks, Clara. Which is how it felt like as the Harrispex, but getting that confirmation is really something. On top of that, the thing where the other player characters are worse at their jobs is cranked all the way up. After the first few days, the Bachelor and Harrispex's relationship breaks down so bad, they're actively trying to hunt each other down for much of the story. You get letters from their allies asking you to find them and warn them the other is coming for them, and you can even rat their locations out to each other for money and medicine. It's fun seeing how the worst possible of their timelines plays out when and you aren't stopping either of them from being jerks. That said, it's clear that Clara is the most rushed of the stories. You can tell mainly because a lot of the side quests are the same side quest each day. For the second half of the game, you have three side quests every day, and they're always the same. Two of them are to warn the Bachelor and Harrispex about each other, and the third, well, Clara starts getting letters, or possibly dream messages, but it's in the letters menu, from her twin sister, the evil Clara who is hiding out somewhere new in the town each day. If you don't find her based on cryptic messages and get her to leave, which takes a lot of sleuthing and running around infected houses, the district she was hiding in will be permanently infected for the rest of the game. It's creepy talking to your own character, too. Whenever you find her in a house, she's always facing away from you, and it's super weird. Dodging the plague in houses to find a weird copy of yourself is great stuff. You then also have to scare away her followers who are hiding out in very hidden places you won't think to look, and if you don't, that area gets infected too. So after the halfway point, every day, these are your three side quests. They're always the same, with the slight variation being the house that the Bachelor and Harrispex are each hiding in is a different place each day. You only get given vague ideas of where they are and you have to look around yourself. And Clara's letters are actually quite cool puzzles, I guess, to figure out where exactly she is in the town based on your intuition and knowledge of the town from two full playthroughs. It's quite interesting, but having all three side quests be the same one each day with no real advancement of the plot really gets to me. The other characters had serious, cool subplots stuff, but Clara just gets busy work. I started to skip these quests after a few days. There's also very little communication that you can heal infected people as Clara. Oh, did I mention that? I didn't mention it earlier on purpose because the game sure didn't. When you use your hands on the infected, it plays a different animation and you get reputation back and they do a little bow. It costs some health too, I guess. So it's another thing you can do to keep your reputation up. And it's also a cool trade-off because you lose health for doing it as well. And there's a risk of getting infected while you're in those districts doing this. But I don't remember being tutorial or told by the game you can do this. I only know about this from other videos mentioning it. I know Pathologic is a game that prides itself on not conveying stuff and letting you figure things out, but from a design perspective this feels like a misstep.
I feel like if they'd had more time or resources, they'd have made this much clearer. I mean, they seem to give the implication Clara's attack is an attack. You use it to kill people, and it kills the first person you try to heal, and the first person you actually heal happens in a cutscene. They do the opposite of letting you know you can do this. And this only works on these characters too, not the people who appear to be in the early stages of infection. They just drop dead. Like I said earlier, for the HD edition, all the character audio was re-recorded, but in Clara's scenario, specifically for Katarina on around day three, for some reason one of the old voice actor's lines is still in there. Nothing threatens your daughter. Everyone will die, but you will remain. I feel like this sort of oversight probably happened because development of Clara was rushed, even for the HD version, and an old line slipped through and didn't get caught. Which makes sense, a very small amount of players ever get to the point this could happen, and I'm glad they spent the time elsewhere instead of triple checking all the voice lines for every character for every character's story, but it's at least a good indicator of how generally rushed some of the Changeling's stuff is. It's a minor thing, but it points to the major thing. Or at the very least, I noticed it and I want to pretend that I can make a point out of it. Overall, if you were interested in pathological story, Clara's route is really satisfying. If you're not, it's just more text and combat even more frustrating than before, and yet more walking. But it's much more rewarding and forthcoming with information than the others. You put the work in, you played 20 to 40 hours of story, now lots of the missing pieces you were curious about can get filled in. The story isn't pulling its punches either, they know you've already played the game once. I love a lot of sequels to movies and games where they don't need to re-establish or explain the simpler stuff, they can just go nuts with established material and ideas, and this really hits that spot. It gets kind of meta toward the end too, so it's all about trickery to you? Wherever have you come from? No, I detest trickery. If we ourselves are to suffer deception, our hands are no longer tied. It's like Clara kind of knows what's happening without having to be told. Some of her text options imply information she never even learns herself, but you know it from the other stories. This is some Malkavian shit right here. God, I should really make that vampire video I teased years ago. It's on the pile, somewhere. Hey you, what are you doing out of your cage? I'll get to you! It even starts to become clear what the story might really have been about all along. Like, what does the polyhedron actually do? People say it can store dreams so people can revisit them and share them, or trap a soul and keep a dead person alive. But what does that mean? Are souls literal things? Or an ephemeral, conceptual thing? The idea of someone? The presence they can manifest through the effects of actions from while they were alive? Is a piece of my soul in this video, perhaps even surviving after my death? I put a lot of myself in my work. Am I immortal now? In a sense, maybe I am. I'm going to say the word now. Now. When did I say that? Looking at the clock, it's 4.16am on the 9th of November 2019. But... When did I really say it? I, now, will be 27 and talking about pathologic forever, even if you come back in another 27 years. Maybe I'm immortal and freed from earthly flesh by existing in the form of a video. Maybe the opposite is true. Maybe I'm trapped here forever, and maybe this is worse than being dead. <clears throat> Forgive me if my speech is unclear or absurd. You have a lot more in-depth conversations along these philosophical and spiritual lines, and to me now, the polyhedron feels like a metaphor for video games themselves. The rest of the town represents the down-to-earth, day-to-day boring reality of walking to places, talking to people, getting lied to, being a regular person, eating food, getting sick sometimes, and eventually dying. But in video games, in art, death isn't real. You can be whoever you like. Games are stories, but more than that, a way for people to share their stories with others forever, to take part in them and live on past the boundaries of their simple material existence. Everyone who made Pathologic will be dead one day, but they'll still be here, in this world they made, staring out at you in eternal polygons, talking to you, sharing their ideas and feelings, a hand reaching from the grave to grasp you once more. Art is the road to awe to permanent expression, and games are a collaborative expression too. You're playing it, interacting, being in it. This game is made for you, aren't you a part of it? This game is a reminder of the immense spiritual value of games. To be somewhere else and move and act in it, to be a piece of someone else's vision for a moment. The polyhedron represents the uplifting, unrealistic, and yet truly real power imbued upon us by our ability to have dreams, literally and figuratively. 
That's just how it reads to me, though. It certainly feels that way at times. Speaking of the Polyhedron, when you visit there as Clara partway through, you get to descend to the bottom and meet the gods of the world several days earlier than the other characters. They're genuinely shocked to see you this time. It's like Clara herself has more power than the creators thought she would, and here explains why Clara is the way she is, why there's such confusion about her nature, why there's two of her. The powers that be are in disagreement over who she is and what she's doing. One of them thinks she's a thief and the other thinks that she is some kind of divine being in their story. I think this is actually really clever. The powers that be are having competing interpretations of this character they've made. Clara's quest eventually leads to the discovery of how her healing hands work. They transform people's blood, give them something that can protect them from the disease. And if she uses it on stronger people, for example her bound, if they're sacrificed and their blood is taken, it can be used to make many cures for the plague. So she can get seven of her bound to agree to atone for their sins by being sacrificed to save the town. When you describe this to Foreman Oyun, he sees it as a chance to undo the damage he's caused and agrees wholeheartedly. He tells you to tell the Harrispecs to not bother with the final trial, the one where he jumps into a hole and dies, since he no longer needs to kill him to protect his position in the kin. You can straight up ask him what happens if he'd gone in the hole, and he tells you he would have died! Because yeah, it's a big hole! I left this out when I was talking about the Harrispecs for dramatic effect, but I don't want to not mention it. As the Harrispecs, you do get Clara cryptically offering to assist you, and if you agree, when you go in the hole, you instead get this cool scene where you can see your own corpse surrounded by executors, and you can choose someone from Clara's bound to die in your place. Artemy survives by doing this and then fights the foreman, so it really was a spiritual experience, if you let the changeling into your life at least. I guess this is because Clara in the Harrispecs' story doesn't get her shit together enough to realise she can use Oyun to solve the plague problem directly herself. Anyway, it's very funny to me that in Clara's run, the Harrispex is genuinely prepping to jump into a hole and die. So Oyun and six others agree to make this sacrifice, and that's her ending. The town and tower get preserved, but at the expense of people sometimes giving up their lives to maintain it. I like this ending. It feels like the reminder that for society to survive intact requires work and sacrifice to protect itself from its own internal tensions and contradictions, that sort of thing. Clara's map evolutions are suitably miraculous. Instead of either the town or the tower being monstrous, the tower is a part of the town, harboring some new thing, a dream, a life, the future, and the town is feeding it. It's a symbiotic relationship, which takes sacrifice, but which might be worth preserving. And the sky is dreamlike, reflecting either Clara's more miraculous, fantastical perspective, or her knowledge that the world really is a dream of sorts. Clara's first extra ending is nothing special. You've already met them once in this playthrough, so there's no real revelation here. Hey guys, it's me again! Third time round now! How's it going? Whoa, fuck! Okay, that's cool. The game keeps being meta about all the things I think it won't address. Like, just when meeting the developers was starting to become a repetitive idea, here it is getting one-upped by the third go-round making fun of how that's starting to feel. And here in the game, Clara kind of validates my thoughts about the town and the polyhedron, talking about these characters as if they're fragments of real people. And in a way, I really do feel like I know these people now. I've spent a lot of time with them in their world, experiencing their creation. You can even ask them more directly what the other characters' stories were supposed to be about. It's a fantastic send-off getting to discuss the story with its creators. Holy shit! That's so fucking cool! I talked about this earlier! It is on purpose! Oh man, this is great! I love this! I utterly love this! This is the best thing ever! And it's so tiny, so small! It's the devs showing you all the little tricks they used to make you frustrated and trapped, right there, being complained about by you! Ah, oh, God, it's excellent! You can ask what their plan was with the Changeling, and they make a joke about how rushed and slapped together it was. That's fun. I like that they're acknowledging things the player would definitely have noticed about this by now. It feels personal and real. They're not resting on their laurels and being pretentious about themes or ideas. They're apologizing for things they knew they got wrong and even making a joke at the expense of this own indulgent last part. What a great ending. God, I've loved the story of this. I wish I could have gone into more detail about it, but just talking about the things that jumped out to me the most has taken this long. It's been genuinely super awesome. Even though it's all fake, it's all just a kid's game, and on top of that it's all just a video game, I feel a sense of achievement for having stuck with it in a strange way. Also, I quite like how hard you have to work to achieve the actual good ending. Like, the Bachelor's ending is just, like, fucked. He's such a shithead. And the Harrispex's ending does kind of destroy a really awesome, cool invention. It's only by actually playing through the whole game at least twice that you get the chance to really get a decent ending for people. Breathe it in. <sighs> Actually, no, don't breathe it in. You didn't have to play the whole game, you just listened to me talk about it for a couple hours. Fuck you! 
There are fine things, old boy, which are more brilliant when unfinished than when finished too much. So Pathologic does a lot of very clever things to make you feel a way games rarely even try to make people feel, and I think it achieves its goals fairly well. It's an experience I have a hard time recommending, and which I know to be flawed, but which I'm extremely glad I played in full. Pathologic is the antidote to the entire modern game design ethos. It isn't a Skinner box that rewards you with simpler satisfactions, like beautiful splatter graphics when you get a headshot, or a quest that makes you feel heroic and powerful. It makes you stare at the abyss of human cruelty and ignorance, and dares you to blink, to close the game and give up. I can't think of many other games that manage that. I super love this game, and its world, even though I don't think I'll ever want to touch it again once I'm done making this video. I'm glad I did it all, and I feel like I've learned a lot about the potential of games, and the many unique ways games can have all kinds of effects on you. All that said, and I've said it so much in this video, I'm not making this to recommend a 15 year old game. I'm making it because I couldn't recommend this 15 year old game. I could barely even recommend it to myself. It took years to get around to playing it past the first couple hours. I had a really interesting time, but 65 hours is a long time to spend to eventually have an interesting time, and I couldn't in good conscience inflict that on someone else by telling them to try it. Especially not now. So, yeah, love Pathologic, amazing game, one of the best games ever, artistic masterpiece, but don't play it, it sucks. Luckily, there exists a game that does everything Pathologic 1 does wrong, right. A game I can recommend so, so much more. That game is Pathologic 2. You don't have to play 1 to understand 2, especially not now that I've told you everything you need to know about it. When I sat down to play Pathologic 2, I cynically assumed it would be a compromised version of 1, graphically and technically improved, but lacking the sorts of bold design elements that contributed to making the original so unique. Like, making a game like Pathologic more accessible and understanding for a newer audience, making it more engaging to play even, would surely mitigate what it did best. I've never assumed so wrong. It's even more horrifying, even harder, and a massive step forward in every possible way. Except the music. The music in one is better in my opinion, but the music is still incredible stuff. Like, top 10 best music in games, no question. The creators made good on maintaining the atmosphere and feel while removing the bugs and elements that were truly bad and took away from the experience. They even threw in meta stuff for people who played the first, or even people who knew the twists from the first I learned painstakingly the hard way, and you just learned easily over one video. Perhaps, finally, after all these long years, the deep game is here. Well, almost here, because Pathologic 2 isn't done yet. It's not in early access per se, but not only is it still getting what I'd say are critical bug fixes, for example an update while I was making this video solved the performance problems I would have talked about right now, so nice one there, but only one of the game's original stories is in this version, at least right now, the Harrispex. It's still a full game, because Pathologic was three full games already, basically, but they're going to add more if they can afford to. I'd buy the others as DLC or expansions, frankly. There was a demo, The Marble Nest, a few years ago, where you play as The Bachelor for a day, and they just patched that into the main game as an improved version of itself, and that's awesome too. And yes, The Bachelor is even more of a shit. I love him. Truth does not do as much good in the world as its counterfeits do evil. God, what a great character. I love him so much. He's just, he's so well written as an insufferable fucker. Oh man, he's great. I swear to God, I'm gonna cosplay as him first chance I get. Pathologic 2 isn't exactly a block, but there. Sorry, I've spent hours and hours recording this voiceover. The game isn't exactly a blockbuster smash hit. It's a niche sequel to a barely known cult classic from Russia a decade ago, loved mostly by native Russian speakers and Western pretentious nerd critics. That's not a jab at pretentious nerd critics, I'm one of those. Did you hear that fucking bit about this video having a soul? Come on, let's not pretend I'm any better. But even if we love it, we're not exactly a huge demographic. I don't tend to do calls to action in my videos. I like to let people make up their own minds about what to do with their lives or whether a game is for 
them. If you play Pathologic 1 after I deliberately didn't recommend it, congratulations, you passed the true test by deciding to play the game for yourself, and I love you for that. Good luck with the fight with Bali, and on day one you can find extra food left out on Nina's grave. Pretend I left that for you. Mwah. Keep the fact, I didn't recommend the first game, despite loving it, in mind when I say you should buy Pathologic 2. It still might not be for you, but you absolutely must try it to find out. And in a world where mainstream games are starting to feel like they're converging upon the same Pavlovian uniform design with only minor branding variations, supporting independent work and true experiments with the form, even if they don't turn out to be something you personally like, seems like THE step forward for video games. The only other obvious step forward I can think of is starting a game developers union. Pathologic 1 is the best game you didn't play. It's the best game I almost didn't play. But Pathologic 2 is better, and you are going to play it. Go experience one of the most unique, satisfyingly hurtful experiences there is in gaming. I'd analyse it in detail, but that would require spoiling it, and you are going to play this, so I wouldn't do that to you. Not for a while, at least. I need time to collect data about other people's experiences and think about how it achieves the effects it does. And I want to play it all the way through three more times. Okay, everybody break, go play Pathologic 2, and meet back here in, I don't know, six months to compare notes for my analysis of the sequel. Oh, and whatever you do, don't take the traveler's deal! You weren't supposed to take the deal, Brendan! Hey, thanks for watching all the way, friend. My videos are supported by my backers over on Patreon, and I love them for it. I used to do a thing where I read everyone out who backed a certain amount during the credits, but I have the best problem ever of there being too many people to do that, so I'm reading them out one last time before I change things over. In the future, people who back me $10 or more per video can vote on what my next video is. I'll have polls for what I feel like working on or based on ideas and suggestions you folks give me. I always want to do like four different things at once, so this will hopefully give me some more perspective. I'm amazed that I I've somehow been as well supported as I have, and I'm eternally thankful for being able to do ridiculous things like get covered in soy, build and destroy a set, or spend almost a month playing and reading and writing about an old Russian video game masterpiece. With your continued support, I hope to do even more ridiculous things. So for the last time, at least for the foreseeable future, if I ever finish any of the video games I'm trying to make, I'll hide a reading of all my patrons' names in there. In addition to all the names scrolling past the screen right now, I'd especially like to thank Gay Rosencrantz, Eight Goblins in a Trench Coat, At Coincel Pro, A Bowl of Creamy Tomato Soup, A Cat with Shades and a New California Republic First Recon Beret, A Deftly Styled 4K Merkin HD Underscore 1080p, A Fish Named Nabby, A Psychologically Damaged Dragon, A Blinken, Aaron D. Carter, Abby Ballinger, Aislin, Ada Hall, Adam Appel, Adam Benzen, Adam Melby, Adam Tenku, Adam Warsong, A.D. Thornton Smith, Adult Sword Owner, Aiden Cruz, Al Swigert, Alan Orozco, Alicia Lemons, Alex Lemkovich, Alex Madsen, Alex Parkinson, Alex Walston Rudol, Alexis Shambrook, Alicia Parker Martell, Alison J, Alan Smith, Alisaurus, Alison Sugar, All Thief, Amanda Beverly, Alastair, thank you for playing Life is Strange, Amber Dorsey, Anakin Frywalker, Andrea Chen, Andrew Brannan, Andrew Gilly, Andrew Harding, Andrew Jackson, Andrew Scheimer, Andrew Wanker, Andy Karras, Anthony Ha, Anthony Peoni, Antonin E. Dumenk, Aoife O'Brien, April Marches On, Arsehole Tep the Insufferable, Artifind Felcantamo, Ash, Asher Holy, Astrid Harper, Orgus, Orin Shaw, Aus Pun, Avery P. Look Mum, he said my name, I'm famous now, please love me, Avi Finkel, Az, Bad Kamish, Banjo Hits, Bardic College of Controversy, Basugasu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu, Beatrix Williams, Bebo Sloth, Beekeeper Gal, Ben Slater, Bendik Krogson, Benjamin Davidson, Benjamin Reuter Delnavoz, Besot and Jenny, Billy Reed, Bleed Red, Bob from Accounting, Bongwater T, Bo Scar, Bjorn Lammers, Brandon Broughton, Brendan Dunsmuir Goss, Brendan Young, Brian Johnston, Brian Parr, Brianna Maria McKenzie, Bryce Pullen, Bridget Ganey, Buddy Sales, Bush, Button, Byron Callan, Caden the Dingo, Kate Seath, Caleb Romo, Callum Megginson, Cameron Dillon, Cameron Ross, Charismatic, 
Casey Explosion, Cat Coupeau, Kate, Chance Mims, Chard Botham, Charles Sizz, Charlie Hawley, Charlie Pepper, Chloe Coopers, Chris Ragnacci, Chrissy Dial, Christian Gatey, Christopher Petroni, Christopher Waltz, Christy Camori, Chutney Ferret, Kieran, CJ is a hot boy, 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 hot boy. Claire the Shambler, Cleaver Bacon, Clown Shoes, Colin Andrew, Colin Pochi, Connor Wilkinson, Connor Rain Keenan, Courtney DeWurst, Crazy Wee Monkey, Critters Mai, CT O'Connor, Daddy Corbin, Dagmar Markera, Dammit Joe, Damousey, Dan Sparks, Danny G, Darag Exton, Dark Lady Vanstar, Dark Side Flame, Darwin Harris, David Barrel, David Christie, David Nguyen, David Rose, definitely not a robot, Der Schilderich, Deus Ex Caffina, Devon's Hands Melt, Darloth, Debella Kaminsky, Dingus, Dr. Mike, Dog Summer Camp, Domas Siodvitis, Dominic Gilfoyle, Dominic Rocchio, Donan, Donovan, a person of interest, Doug Carroll, DeVoe, Drake Lazarus, Duncan Parker Newton Gaines, Dungeons and Randomness, Dylan New, Dylan Teagan, Dylan Wignall, Aiton Goldstrom, Ella Carr, LB, Eli Bosnick's favourite sex friend, Eli J.F. Winnebst, Eliza Kogan, Elizabeth Hamilton, Elizabeth Kubiak, Ellie Rogers, Elise Kennedy, Emily Christ, Emma, Emma McCartan, Eric Davies, Eric Hunter, Erica Oligas, Eric Win Lol, Erika Sanwa Subarashi Ningendes, Erin Almas, Itansel, Eugene Butler, Evan, Evan Hill, Evan Ritchie, Fantaboy15, Fatboy Likes Cake, Findlay Bowick Copley, Flag Burner, Flaboo, Flebsy, Flex the McSignals, Florian Knox, Forty Tentacles, Frick, aka Unironic Love for Sonic, Gabriel Savita Ramirez, Garrett Gutierrez, Gary Marshall, Gottsein Varta, Gracie Lipscomb, Greg Day, Haley, Halder Olafsson, Handsome Unlimited, Hannah Rees, Happy Kitty, Hash Brown, Hattie Masters, Havelock Smiggles, Heel Al Gankovic, Henry Dolling, Hilary Thomas, Heel Webdom, High Rum, Hero R. War, Hudson Hayward, Ian Earl, I Does Not, Im Raft, Industrial Robot, I Rock as in Granite, Isaac Silbert, Izette the Transcripted Who Stole Your Bones, Jack Alderton, Jack Arnon, Jack Davies, Jackie Scroggs, Jacob Brood Shoemaker Hamblin Pike, Jacob Martinson, Jay Levy, Jake Nicholson, Jacob Bruins, Jacob Homan, James Adair, James Duncan Fiper, James King, James Ronald, James Stowe, James Wormsley, James Williams, James Edwards, Jamie Wallace, Jane Lusby, Janet Computerface, Scruffy64, Jasmine, Jason Harris, Jason Walter, Jason's Rage, Jay Calder, Jeffrey Theobald, Jeffrey Wickstrom, Jelga, Jerry Terry, Jess Galt, J.I. Mendaro, Jimmy Alessandrini, Joe Tyler, Joanna Roy, Joe Rowe, Ulinxis, John Stevenson, John's Socks, John Cantwell, John Fortescue, who I personally believe to be a decent individual, John Kieran, John Carlos Rivera, Jonah Flam, Jonathan Wardill, Jordan Tullis, Jordan Brown, Joseph Earp, Josh, Josh Doctor of Purgeology Beach, Josh Thomas, Josh Watkins, Josh the Cellist, Joshua Brady, Joshua Featherston, Joshua Hagen Fenton, Joshua Misrak, Julia Bashond, Julian, Justin Dutch, Justin Whitney, Cafsile, Cameron Fall of the Patriarchy, Karl Marx said Twink Writes, Kat McIntyre, Kate Brock, Kate J, Catherine Alma Caslin, Kino Kintony, Kenan Ward, Legolas underscore Catan, Kevin Thurber, Kit Foley, Cold Beans, Commissars, KP, Chris, Krista Wallace, K. Zvezdorov, Ladies Making Comics, Lance Manley, Sorcerer of Sin, Lauren, Lawrence Hutton Smith, Lavinia, Leftist Tech Support, Leah Schuster, Lena, Letters and Punctuation, Let the Loser Melt, Lester Alfruff, Lewis McDermott, Lightcraft Mini Paint Studio, Lindsay Bowser, Lint, Logan Mears, Loveling, Lowen Deneve, Lucas Marcelli, Lucy X, Luke Swanson, Luz Faltex, M. Allen, Masil, Mackenzie, Malav Shah, Mallow, Malpertui, Ma, Mario Babich, Mark Bools, Mark Smith, Matheson Bailey, Matt Feenan, Matthew E. Cooper, Matthew Mags, Matthew Scalort, Max W, McBricks, McMuster, Mecha Shiva, Megan Bond, Megan Cahill, Meg Mazel, Mel is my favourite fan, especially because they're non-binary, Me Napfeast, 
Mert ist mein Baba, Michael Campbell, Michael Curtis, Michael H. Prey, Mikael Jans, Michelle Bearhart, Microsoft Anator, Mike Jeffcott, Mike Wayne, Milo, Mipit, Mitt, Morpho Portis, Mother's Basement, My Weight in Nudes, Nako Nakoni, Naoto Shiragane, Nathan Beam, Nazi Destroyer, Nathan Hoare, Nathaniel P. Graham, Niala Ernswa, Neverminder, Nick Abigail, Nick Fidian, Nick Pollard, Ugelenu Antife, Ningen's Wit Attitudes, Nolan Segrist, Noel Rush, Ocarina Solo, Octonian, Ushand, Omari Anthony, Otter, Owen Piper, Paige Dwight, Panda Kaby, Parker Vincent, Parsnips, Patrick Brown, Patrick Morrison, Patrick Poitras, Paz Brook, Pelops, Pendrakan, Peng J. Howell, Perry Lewin, Pete Asik, Peter Broderson, Peter Wonder, Petra McCartney, Philip Metzger, Phobos2390, Phoenix Moonbeam, Piss.gif, Poplar, Preston Michalizio, Previous Mammoth, Psy43, Quay, Team Alfk, Qui-Gon Jinn, Good Night Sweet Prince, Rachel Ann, Recovering Zombie, Red Rosa, Reese Adams, Reginald Buttersphincter, Renbimon, Rhythm, Richard Pearson, Riley Knight, Ro Morris, Rob Rose, Robert Ankeny, Robin Veitch, Rocket Owl, Rory Olek, Ross Schlichier, Ryan Meany, Ryan Vienno, Rylan Hudson, S.M., Sage Summer, Sace, Salem Alarak, Sam Glass, Sam M. Keen, Samael, Samuel Baker, Samuel Vergara Ekman, Sarah Yertgvist, Saria Melody, Scott Girton, Scramp Short Friend, Seamus Yusarian, A Serpent Perplexed, Sean Locke, Sebastian Emanuelson, Sebastian Lorenzo, Sebastian Simon, Seeker of Light, Shana Hansen, Shane Smith, Shane Boyles, Sheena Artrip, Shikon Neko, Shining Star Justice, Siegfried Pinzer, Silas Pumpkins, Syllabub Cosplay, Silverwolf, Sir Monday, SJ, Sly Bones, Snazgool, Sol, Spencer St. James, Spicy Fun Dip, Squid Heart, Starboy, Stardust Ultima, Stephen Notley, Sugarcane, Summit Dreams, Super Depressing Lifestyle Championship Edition, Super Kate, Super Dark 33, Suppercut, Sven Lorenz, Swamp Selkie, Sidney Stevenson, Cincyone Breskel, Sebastian Demel, Tatonator, Talk Gibberish, Tapio Unto Oscari Turonan, Tauron the Exile, Ted Teddington Tedsville, That Flying Scotsman, The 4000th Yamaha DX7 Trent Reznor Broke With His Mic Stand or Foot, The Biophone, The D Pad, The Durbinator, The Immortal Science of Dialectical Materialism, The Spectre of Communism, The Cinemom, Thinkoplex, This Drawing of a Tiger, Thomas Frey, Thomas Kent, Thornton Prime, Three Possums in a Trench Coat Pretending to be a Human, Thunter, Tiaz, Tim Yelverton, Timothy Crowley, Tom Pinkney, Tom Thorogood, Torbjorn Auglind Wilhelmsen, Translated Leak, Trix, Trikadin, Tristan Young, Turpid, Tyler Nunez, Unsurpassed Travesty, Velastrius, Velath, V. Hoffman, Vesco, Vincent Omnia, Wackman, Wiebke, William Case, William Moore, William Nelson, Willow H, Whisk, XX Emo Samurai XX, Y Grek 32, Your Good Boy, Yurix, Yvonne with a smiley face, Zachary Prokowski, Zach Radley, Zemilla, Zenny, Zero Anonymity, Zoe, Zoe Burke, Orn Magnus Palson, and finally, honestly, I'm just curious what you'll do with my name.